morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare, jointly with the Committee on Contracts. I'd like to thank my colleague, Ben Kalos, Chair of the Contracts Committee, for convening this hearing today. Today, the, co the committees will be examining the, the process for shelter provider contracts at Department of Homeless Services and how that process affects the quality of shelters and services for the thousands of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. In fiscal year 2019, DHS awarded, awarded $2.1 billion in contracts to provide temporary shelter and services to homeless New Yorkers, with the majority of shelters operated by not-for-profit providers. These contracts help the city meet its legal obligation under the right to shelter mandate. However, the scale of, homelessness, of the homelessness crisis has resulted in the city spending an enormous amount of money to house people in settings that can be acquired quickly, like commercial hotels. Unfortunately, commercial hotel residents are often disconnected from their communities, schools, and services for as long as a year or more. And though there is a plan to phase out commercial hotels by 2022, we cannot ignore them in the interim. The nature of housing people in settings like hotels means that there is often no appropriate space for meal preparation, recreational activities, or other essential services like mental health care or other types of health care. Barriers remain in accessing such services off-site due to lack of availability, scheduling challenges, and arduous transportation, among other reasons. While shelter spending may sound large, the reality is that the city has continually asked providers to do more with less, and it is apparent that these provider contracts are often severely underfunded. These contracts need to be viable and set providers up to succeed in order to attract competitive <coughs> and quality bidders. It is imperative that agents like DHS, agencies like DHS uh, have procurement, evaluation, and assessment processes that are through thorough and comprehensive in order to ensure that services meet expectations and that any operational issues will be swiftly and appropriately addressed. Maintaining multi-year emergency contracts without significant, drops, without significant drops in the shelter census and long lengths of stay is not a sound way to do business in addressing a crisis of this magnitude. Inadequacies in the contracting process and its oversight mechanisms is ultimately a disservice to the individuals and families who are in real need of reliable support and quality programming as they try to navigate the system. Those in shelter deserve more from us than merely meeting our legal obligation and minimum standards, and the contracting process should facilitate success for both providers and their clients. I want to thank very much um, uh, Commissioner Banks and his team from the administration, uh, as well as all the advocates that are here today joining us, and I look forward to hearing uh, from you all on these critical issues. And at this point, I would like to acknowledge uh, my, my colleagues who are here today, Councilmember Bob Holden of Queens, Councilmember Brad Lander of Brooklyn, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik of Queens, and we are uh, expecting others to be joining us as well. I'd also like to thank committee staff uh, for preparation for today's hearing. I'm into Kilowan Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omery, Policy Analyst, Frank Sarno, Finance Analyst, and uh, my staff as well, Jonathan Boucher, my Chief of Staff, and Elizabeth Adams, my Legislative Director, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Chair Kalos. I want to start with a thank you to the Chair of the General Welfare uh, Committee, Steve Levin, and your uh, committee members for holding this joint hearing. Steve, there is, I don't know if there's anyone in the council or the city at large uh, who is more focused on the general welfare of our residents, uh, who, like uh, the DHS Commissioner Steve Banks, is fully committed all in and has received calls from me in the middle of the night, 11 p.m., midnight, about individual constituents who needed our help and the fact that uh, both, both you and Commissioner Banks are always on call and always there to do what you can to help any New Yorker. So thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. I'm Chair of the City Council's Committee on Contracts. For those of you who are watching at home or via live stream, please feel free to participate in the hearing by tweeting at Ben Kalos. Uh, also, if you're a member of the media, uh, please also feel free to submit questions to us uh, during this hearing. 
I'd like to begin by speaking directly to the more than 60,000 people who woke up this morning in our city's shelter system, uh, at least 20,000 of which are children who are in our public schools as we speak. We see you. More importantly, we hear you and we wanna make things better. The purpose of this hearing is to identify areas where we can do just that. Commissioner Banks and his team have been gracious enough to discuss some of what's going on in the shelters with us, and so far DHS has been responsive to some of our concerns we've raised. We hope to hear uh, a lot of that reflected in uh, today's testimony. As the contracts chair, it's my responsibility to identify areas for improvement in the contracting process, and there are still many issues that remain, particularly in the way DHS procures services at its homeless shelters. DHS, like most city agencies, is bound by the state's multitude of procurement laws, which require contracting officers to award city contracts to the lowest responsible bidder. Sometimes agencies may also procure through a process called negotiated acquisition, which is what DHS used in these cases. One such negotiated acquisition contract just this summer was for $42 million with the Acacia Network, with a track record of at least 118 open violations at its shelters, many of which remain open today. In July, the Wall Street Journal reported that the Department of Homeless Services had asked the Department of Investigation to review the relationship between the shelter provider Acacia and the subcontractor who provides security for its shelters. In October, the independent investigative journalism website Sludge published an article on the, quote, business of homelessness. The reporting showed Acacia's contracts with the city have grown to $259 million as of fiscal year 2019, while shelter residents have spoken out about a lack of medical care, security, and basic living supplies provided. And this is up from contracts of just 10 or $12 million before this administration uh, began. Our contract should be structured to ensure that taxpayer dollars go directly to helping homeless New Yorkers, and so I express concern over accusations of self-dealing that may be hindering services that I told the Wall Street Journal that we would hold a hearing on the homeless service contracts. Last month, the New York Times further reported the death of a resident of an, at an Acacia-run facility on the upper, upper West Side in Manhattan. As I told the Times, since this reporting began, residents in Acacia shelters have come forward to tell me about the dangerous conditions they have been put in and that they were threatened with eviction if they had to call the police about the conditions in the shelter. I want to just take a moment uh, because government actually has four branches, just not three. That fourth branch is the media and it is without, we wouldn't be here without a strong partnership with them. And uh, re reporters like Katie Honan, who have been doing the, the muckraking of uh, finding out what was going on. Also people who are advocates and sharing similar stories, uh, in particular Josh Dean at Human, uh, with whom I've had the opportunity to meet along with him, as well as people who are in the Acacia shelters or have moved beyond the Acacia shelters. And without both of those groups of people, I don't think we would be here today taking a closer look at what's going on. It's simply unacceptable to have recurring vermin infestations, non-working smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, obstructed passageways, locked exits, and defective window guards at these shelters, and to proclaim still be in compliance with the city's contractual obligations. As elected representative of the people of the city, it's our responsibility to ask these questions in order to ensure that the city agencies are held accountable when their contractors do not deliver mandated services. This is how we protect public funds and make sure agencies are doing their jobs, especially if corrective action plans and DOI referrals are not getting vendors back on track. I'd like to thank com the Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council, Alex Polina, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, Finance Unit Head John Russell, as, uh, as well as our new uh, Finance Analyst Peter, uh, my Chief of Staff Jesse Townsend, Legislative Director Wilfredo Lopez for their work on this hearing. I'll now turn this back to uh, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, I want to uh, call now on members of the administration um, for their testimony. Uh, we are joined this morning by DHS First Deputy Commissioner Molly Park, uh, DSS Deputy Commissioner uh, for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs Aaron Drinkwater, um, 
and I believe Vincent Pulo, uh, NYC ACO. And um, I'll ask Council of the Committee to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Sure. You may begin. Good morning, Chairpersons Levin and Kalos, and members of the General for Welfare and Contracts Committees. My name is Molly Park, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Homeless Services. Thank you for inviting me today to discuss our homeless service provider contracts and the work we have done to ensure shelter providers are true partners in making reforms to improve programs and services for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Following our comprehensive 90-day review in 2016, DHS undertook a number of reforms to not only create and enforce new processes, but also to support our provider partners. To begin, I would like to provide some historical context on the shelter system that built up haphazardly over the past four decades. From 1994 to 2014, the shelter population in New York City increased 115 percent. Between 2011 and 2014, following the abrupt end to the Advantage Rental Assistance Program, the DHS census increased by 38 percent. During this same time, New York City faced increasing economic inequality because of stagnant wages, a lack of affordable housing, and an increased cost of living. Rents increased by nearly 19 percent, while wages increased by less than 5 percent. There was also a loss of 150,000 rent-regulated apartments. The resulting dramatic increase in the shelter population, coupled with underinvestment, created real challenges as DHS and the agency's not-for-profit partners worked to adequately ensure safe, clean and secure conditions. Within that context, DHS has taken steps to improve shelter conditions and to support providers by updating our contracts and approach to funding. One of the critical reforms adopted following our 90-day review was rate rationalization for homeless shelter services to ensure shelter providers are adequately resourced to provide high-quality homeless services. Additionally, updating our contracts provided a mechanism for DHS to address issues with shelter conditions. With improved contracts and new approaches to quickly make repairs, providers are now better equipped to maintain high-quality shelters and deliver services to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. DHS holds contracts with over 75 human service providers for a range of services that DHS provides to serve families and individuals experiencing homelessness. For new shelters, DHS has an open-ended RFP process, which means proposals from not-for-profit providers are accepted on a rolling basis. When a proposal is submitted, the quality of the proposal is evaluated and scored by agency program experts working with the Department of Social Services Contracts Office in accordance with New York City Procurement Policy Board rules. This evaluation includes an assessment of the need for the proposed shelter population capacity, for example, families with children, adult families, or single adults, the location, the viability of the building, the scope of the client services, the experience of the provider, pricing, and other operational matters. The proposal is also reviewed by agency leadership for consistency with turning the tide's borough-based approach, as well as the capacity and equitable siting goals the plan will achieve once fully implemented. DHS has invested more than a quarter of a billion dollars annually in additional funding in our not-for-profit shelter providers to address decades of disinvestment and to modernize the outdated rates that they had been paid for too long. This includes funding for social workers and contracted families with children shelters, housing specialists in all shelters, and standardized rates for services such as maintenance and supplies. This was done to ensure providers can deliver the high-quality services families and individuals experiencing homelessness deserve as they get back on their feet. As we develop the funding parameters for the specific components of the services our partners provide, a model evolved, hence the term model budget. The model budget exercise uses a set of templates to assist in evaluating all aspects of the provision of shelter, maintenance, staffing, and client services specific to a particular shelter capacity and type to determine a facility's appropriate annual budget. Moving away from the previous one-size-fits-all approach, the model accounts for different populations, families with children, adult families, and single adults, including mental health, substance abuse, employment, assessment, and general population. 
the models reflect the ongoing priority placed by both DHS and the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance on shelter repairs and are reflective of state requirements contained within the New York Codes, Rules and Regulations, Part 900 and four, Part 491, as well as city regulations and statutes as appropriate. The per diem is built from various components of the model, which standardize rates to provide consistent and sustained support for quality services. These rates are calibrated for shelter size, recognizing, for example, that a small site may be more expensive to operate on a per person basis because there are fewer economies of scale. The model also includes maintenance, client supplies, food, transportation, and shelter administration. Another component of the model is the establishment of staff to client ratios for direct service staff, for example, caseworkers, supervisors, housing specialists, social workers, peer specialists, recreation staff, and residential aides across all contracted shelter providers along with the funding so that providers can meet and maintain these ratios for their individual shelter capacity. Through the model budget, DHS provides staffing and funding for services based on each of these elements cross-checked with the site's specific capacity and line item costs, which produces this overall per diem and annual budget. Once providers submit a budget proposal using the standard template, the DHS Shelter Program Budget Office compares the proposed budgets to the model and negotiates with DHS program staff to arrive at a near final budget. This process is then completed in close consultation and partnership with the individual provider. After budget proposals are reviewed, the Department of Social Service Finance Office shares budget recommendations with the New York City Office of Management and Budget for approval. Following approval, the contract moves into the amendment phase, which includes legal and procedural checks, culminating in registration with the controller's office. Another component of the model budget is a new, unprecedented way of addressing approved one-time new needs. An example of this would be a one-time cost to replace a boiler that could not be accommodated within the regular maintenance and repair budget. All new contracts provide for an allowance for repairs up to 10% of the total annual contract value. Upon approval of a new need, such as a boiler example, a central DHS allocation funds the cost without requiring an additional contract amendment. In the current exercise with providers, in order to make the contract adjustments for the model, funding for rent, utilities, insurance, and security is included in individual providers' contract amendments to the extent funding is required to bring them to the standard or required levels. The models are flexible enough that with proper justification, providers are able to adjust specific line items to simultaneously ensure the budget meets all necessary requirements and also appropriately reflects the unique operation of that particular shelter location. That said, a site's budget typically cannot go above the total model per diem and generally may not exceed the bottom line within a category. While components of a provider's budget are defined through the model, there are some costs that are unique to each site. This includes rent, utilities, insurance, and security. Appropriate rent values are determined by analyzing a number of factors, including, but not limited to, the housing and urban development, small area, fair market rents, comparable sales in the neighborhood, comparable price per square foot uh, in the neighborhood, current published unit rental rates in the neighborhood, current use of the building, rehabilitation costs, average per diem for comparable shelter, and capacity needs. Rates for utilities and insurance are based on documented actual costs. Security levels are determined in consultation with the NYPD and consider factors such as access control, vertical shifts, and lines of sight. Along with our model budget exercise, we have also invested millions of dollars to reduce our footprint while meeting capacity needs and improving physical conditions at family and adult shelters. As part of the Turning the Tide plan, in FY20, $600 million in capital funding was allocated over 10 years to address physical needs, upgrades, and improvements in city-owned shelters. This builds on over $52 million over four years in FY16 for 30 new capital projects at shelter facilities to address DHS shelter conditions, and $90 million added over five years in FY17 for building upgrades at facilities, including 61 new capital projects. Overall, the September capital plan includes over $600 million for construction and rehabilitation projects, with the bulk of the funding projected to be committed over the next several years. DHS manages some of our projects in-house, and other, generally larger projects are managed in partnership with the Department of Design and Construction. Today, we have 61 projects being actively designed and 24 projects in construction. 
DHS and DDC have 45 projects in the planning stage preparing for design, all of which are planned to begin during this fiscal year. Finally, in the November plan, funds were added to the DHS budget, as well as the other human service agencies, to support adjustments to indirect cost rates for not-for-profit providers. In February 2019, the City of New York adopted the Health and Human Services Cost Manual to standardize cost allocation practices for health and human service providers contracting with the City. The FY20 adopted budget established an indirect cost rate funding initiative based on the cost manual. OMB and the Mayor's Office of Contract Services formed a city implementation team to manage the implementation and rollout and included a provider advisory working group. The November plan funding fulfills the commitment the Mayor and the Speaker made for the adopted FY20 budget. By rationalizing pay rates for our providers, we have improved the conditions of our shelters. At DHS, we conduct biannual routine site review inspections to, both, uh, to identify both current violations as well as conditions that may become problematic over time. RSRIs play an integral role in the contract process. Before a contract is registered, the provider must provide a well-documented plan to address any outstanding physical issues. Without such a plan, DHS will not submit a shelter contract for registration. RSRIs assist us in identifying and mitigating the most immediate safety hazards while also providing an opportunity to conduct preventive maintenance and minimize the number of units placed offline at any given time. During the RSRI, a DHS inspector is accompanied by the landlord, building manager, shelter director, head of maintenance, security, owner representative, caseworker, and or other managerial staff. If any conditions are deemed hazardous or dangerous, the inspector immediately notifies those who are part of the walkthrough. Upon receiving an email of the RSRI results, the provider has 24 hours to address severe deficiencies in the building. The RSRI report provides detail necessary for the provider to develop and implement a remediation plan for the identified building conditions requiring attention. The shelter director also submits a corrective action plan, or CAP, to DHS, which informs next steps to address the conditions identified in the RSRI at the shelter. Multiple reinspections are conducted throughout the process of completing a CAP, which occur prior to the next scheduled RSRI inspection. This inspection system allows us to work with shelter providers to identify building issues, immediately address dangerous or hazardous conditions, prevent deeper infrastructure issues, and follow through to improve the conditions of each shelter. The mayor also established the Shelter Repair Squad as a multi-agency task force to inspect shelter buildings and identify code violations requiring repair. The task force is composed of the Fire Department, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Department of Homeless Services. Each agency has assigned teams to the shelter repair squad, and repairs are done by DHS and landlords. At least twice a year, each agency will inspect facilities for code violations and inform providers of the results. Efforts are coordinated between agencies to maximize the efficiency of inspections, minimize duplication of efforts across teams and agencies, and reduce the burden of frequent inspections. A critical component of the Shelter Repair Squad is the ability for the city to track all shelter building violations, along with measuring the progress made towards ameliorating the identified issues. To drive this task, the city developed a system to report on all city shelters and every violation attributed to each building. Essentially, this acts as a real-time tracker for shelter building violations, allowing the city to appropriately allocate shelter repair squad staff to work with providers to inspect buildings and develop and implement remediation plans. As a testament to the utility of this system, the framework has since been adopted by the state to develop their statewide shelter management system, which allows our oversight agency to more efficiently monitor building systems by tracking the status, remediation, and life cycle of deficiencies and their responses by providers and users. Information is aggregated from various sources available to DHS to provide a central clearinghouse where users retrieve information about shelters or evaluate and track the status of repairs at shelters. This approach facilitates interagency collaboration in improving conditions in shelters and makes it possible to formulate the monthly shelter repair scorecard, which publicly reports on the conditions of homeless shelter facilities. The scorecard helps define the scope of any problems by publicly listing conditions at all homeless shelters in, this, in New York City. The Shelter Repair Squad is a prime example of interagency collaboration to address long-standing issues across the shelter system. 
In the first year of this program, more than 12,000 building violations were closed or corrected. As we have reported previously, the Shelter Repair Squad conducted more than 63,644 shelter inspections from 2016 to 2019, reducing violations that went unaddressed for many years by 90%. Today, many of the remaining, remaining repairs involve normal wear and tear and capital projects, which we are funding, as just discussed. In conclusion, we work closely with our not-for-profit partners so that together we can raise the bar for the supports that we provide to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness at all of our shelter locations citywide. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. I want to uh, start with the, I guess, just addressing the question that brought us all here. Uh, when service providers are up for renewal, in particular, or even a new provider uh, is applying for a contract, what is the vetting process by DHS and uh, similar agencies that go through the Mayor's Office of Contract Services process? And in particular, does anyone at DHS, law department, or another agency involved check the agencies, uh, sorry, the, the nonprofits 990s or other forms and cross check those with Vendex or passport filings or in a situation where you have a vendor that has, I think, over a dozen or more different contracts, even just check the filings for internal consistency. Um, so uh, yes, as part of our effort to reform, uh, you know, what we have described as a haphazard shelter, uh, shelter system that evolved over time, one of the things we are doing is bringing all of our providers into uh, under standard contract mechanisms. Um, as we do that, DHS is working with all of our providers and all of their subcontractors to ensure that everything gets entered into the city's passport system. Passport questionnaires are reviewed to determine any potential conflicts and to uh, make sure that everything is in order and whether transactions are consistent with the Not-for-Profit Revitalization Act. Um, you know, I want to be careful about speaking about any particular cases that are under investigation. We work very closely with our colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services to strengthen transparency and accountability in the contracting process. Um, We've been joined by Councilmember Yeager and Councilmember Tra According to reporting, Akasi is the largest homeless service provider. Is that accurate? Um, I don't have that exact figure right at my uh, fingertips. Acacia does have a very large footprint for the, with the city of New York uh, and with the Department of Homeless Services. It is smaller than it was um, at this point, but it, it, they are, yes, they are a large provider. Why do certain providers consistently have violations across their contracted shelter portfolio? Uh, and yet still see Department of Homeless Service continue to award or renew contracts. For example, Acacia currently has 1,184 open violations. Are we as a city stuck with specific vendors uh, or has DHS been in a position before uh, to uh, restructure deals with specific vendors and uh, let others take over for those parts of the contracts? I think it's very important to nuance that violation data by type of facility. So of the, I was running my own numbers over the weekend, right, of the uh, just shy of, of 1,200 violations in Acacia facilities, more than 1,000 of those are in cluster sites. Uh, DHS has made a very strong commitment to get out of the clusters. We are down more than 60% from the peak a few years ago. Uh, we have announced the next round of cluster conversions that will be happening in the first quarter of 2020 um, and, and more to come. So we will be out of the clusters by the end of 2021 and I think that will be a, a substantial drop in the violations. I think we all agree that those are buildings that are not well suited for shelter in part because of the violations there. And, and we received so, some of this from New Yorkers for Safer Streets who will be testifying later today who actually came by one of my first Fridays, first Friday of every month. You can come meet with me 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Talk about whatever you want. Uh, and I guess one of the follow-up questions is in terms of these 1,184 violations or 
um, particularly all the different violations, is there a way to break this down uh, from just open violations where in your testimony indicated some might be trivial to the extent any violation could be trivial uh, versus breaking them down by class, so class A, B, and C, which relate to how dangerous something might be? Uh, we'd be happy to work with you on that. I can't do it on the fly, but that's certainly something that we can talk about. And I guess the, the second piece of the question is, have you ever had a contract that you didn't renew or a provider that may have had a large footprint that you didn't move forward with? Yes, we have gotten, we have ended our contractual relationships with several providers over the last few years um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it is, in general, I, if I can take a step backwards, it is not in anybody's interest to have a large not-for-profit social service provider fail. Having a, an organization fail is not our goal, it, um, but we have to have the standards that we need met. So what we do is that we work very closely with, whether it's Ocasio or any other social service provider that is struggling, to invest in capacity development, to institute corrective action plans, to do training where that is necessary. And if we cannot get there, we can get out of using that provider. We have done so, and that remains a tool of last resort. So you mentioned that you've done it. Can you give specific examples of, of when you've done it for, for those who, who want, where the proof is in the pudding, as it were? Sure. Uh, Housing Bridge was a provider that we use that we no longer uh, use. We Always Care is, was another provider that we have stopped using. So there are, are several. And in those cases, were people just thrown out on the streets and, and the employees fired, or what, what happened in those situations? We would never throw anybody out on the street. If somebody is in a facility that is, uh, if a client is in a facility that is closing, whether because we are ending the contractual relationship with the provider, or because the provider has opted to do something else with the building, there's a variety of different circumstances, we work with those clients to transfer them to an appropriate um, alternative shelter. So uh, wherever we can take their preferences into account, we do that. Wherever we can place people under permanent housing immediately, we do that. Um, but, but nobody is ever thrown out on the street. Are there situations where you have, whether it's a cluster site or a hotel or a shelter that's operated by a nonprofit, for whatever reason you determine that, that nonprofit can't move forward responsibly and then you actually have taken over the site and allowed the people to stay in place while bringing in a different provider to act responsibly? Uh, we have had cases where a site transitions from one shelter provider to another, yes. Um, in the, the clusters, what we're, as, as you probably know from the cluster flip that has completed, um, we did allow as many, we did have as many households as possible remain in place. At that point, they were, they were no longer shelter clients. They were permanent housing tenants with leases. Um, that was not possible in all cases. Some of the, sometimes the family size weren't appropriate or, or they needed an environment with more ongoing social support that was going to be available in that cluster site. In terms of your commitment to get out of all of the uh, clusters by 2021, there are uh, some, I, I have the uh, sh shelter report uh, that you've posted online and folks can see for themselves at your website and there there are there are a lot of clusters that have violations that are in single digits that being said there's about 10 or so that are in triple digits and uh, whether it's Acacia or Bronx Family Housing or Aguila uh, they represent actually the most of the violations are you prioritizing those with the most open violations for the first set of closures in first quarter of 2020, or how are they being prioritized? So to be clear, we've closed more than 2,200 cluster units already, so, so the uh, upcoming cluster flip is not the first set of cluster closings. I just want to be, be very transparent about that. We are down more than 60% already. The buildings that we are converting from clusters to permanent housing are those that have uh, enti are entirely or predominantly used as as housing for homeless households. Um, 
the buildings that ha might have just a few scattered units are less appropriate for acquisition through city financing and conversion to permanent housing, and we will have a different strategy for those. So, just to be clear, so it sounds like you, so after first quarter 2020, some of the, so, so the quick answer is the closing of a cluster site is not related to the number of violations. Would, would you be open to prioritizing closing some of the cluster sites with the, with let's just say more than 100 violations or? We, we have it's, two. It's 10. We have two separate tracks of how we are uh, proceeding with the closing of the clusters. We are doing, we are converting buildings to permanent housing, um, financing the acquisition of those buildings by responsible nonprofit organizations, financing rehabilitation of the buildings, and, and making sure that the tenants in place all have uh, long-term affordable leases. Those, the buildings that are being prioritized for that cluster conversion strategy are those that are majority currently used as cluster shelter housing. Um, there are another universe of buildings that we have uh, that are where the percentage of units used as shelter is much lower. They are less appropriate for this cluster conversion strategy. We can certainly look at whether or not in that universe we can prioritize the ones with the highest violations. Back to the contracting question, uh, when renewing contracts is one of the factors you're looking at, in particular compensation. Uh, during my opening statement, I talked about wanting to make sure as many of our city dollars actually go directly to those impacted. Uh, and uh, in the real sludge reporting, they indicated that the chief executive officer at Acacia in 2017 was making $815,000 a year. Uh, that the next highest paid person was making 488,206. Uh, how does that factor into the contracting process? Is there a limit to how much we're willing to pay these folks and uh, how, how, how do you factor that in? We are looking at the services that the shelter provider is providing to the city and to the clients. We are looking at their track record um, and making decisions about whether or not we can move forward. I'd say there is a, a package of experience and, and uh, quality of service delivery metrics that we look at. It's not as black and white that if the most, highest most paid person makes more than X, we wouldn't renew the contract. Is there, is there a limit? No, there's not a limit. Okay. Uh, the Daily News reported that a mother of three had been calling uh, 311 uh, and that Acacia had uh, said that if she wanted to renew her lease, that uh, that would need to stop. Uh, whether or not, can you speak to that specific circumstance uh, and what the DHS can do? And then similarly, one of the questions we got leading into this hearing is, that we had a number of people who had experience with the various uh, Acacia and other shelters who wanted to testify how, do fo how, how can DHS provide protections for folks who may wish to blow the whistle. Um, so the, the buildings that were mentioned in the, those press stories are not DHS facilities, so I'm, I'm not gonna comment on those. Um, we would be certainly willing to talk to any client who feels like they need a transfer to an alternative facility. So I, I, so the, in this case, um, the, the person we're talking about is Aisha Poindexter. So if she's called 301 and she feels that she's been retaliated against, who, what is the best person, who is the right person for her to connect with? Sorry, uh, just to clarify, that's the person in the, in the press story? Yes, she okay, was the so one. Okay, so that is not a DHS? So building, I guess so so if, if somebody is receiving sh services through somebody that DHS has contracted with, who can they reach out to for help when they feel retaliated against, when they've called 301? Like, how do they get help beyond calling their local council member? So in general, if somebody needs assistance, we have a, sh we have a shelter hotline. Um, it will get 
answered by a person um, during business hours and connected to, to 311 um, outside of normal business hours so that we can make sure that we are um, tracking it and following up appropriately. And that is absolutely something that we can, can help somebody who is a current shelter client with. For a person who is not a current shelter client and the people who are living in Acacia's permanent housing buildings are not current shelter clients, that is not gonna be the, the right pathway. And because I am not directly involved in administering that particular program, I can't on the record give you, or, or I don't know the right answer for okay. where to, to direct that person. Would you, would you be willing to work with myself and the general welfare chair to create a, a method of allowing people who are having problems with uh, contracted service providers to flag them for DHS and for your intervention? We are always happy to collaborate. I just want to be very clear that if it isn't a DHS contract, you know, I have limited tools. Okay, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, uh, Councilmember Salmanca from the Bronx and uh, Councilmember Rosenthal from the Upper West Side. I'd like to uh, turn it over to our uh, Chair, Steve Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Kalos. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. Oh, sorry, I had one last question. <clears throat> sure. Sorry, one, one last question before I turn it over. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, one of the providers in, in question, Acacia, uh, expressed concern to members of the city council that they had stopped being paid uh, as a result of the press coverage, as a result of the investigation, as a result of this hearing. Uh, have DHS stopped paying Acacia uh, and, and thereby jeopardized those receiving services from Acacia? No. Um, we would never stop making payments based on, on press coverage. Um, there have been there are no payments being withheld. Um, we are actively reviewing payments right now. There have been, there are some contracts that are not registered yet because we have been working through various uh, technical and accountability issues. We can't make a payment on a contract that isn't registered, but we have been working very closely with Acacia to make sure that they are addressing the accountability issues that we need to do so that we can continue to move forward with that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'll start off <clears throat> uh, with a little bit about hotels. Um, <clears throat> is, it, is it still DHS's policy to be out of hotels by 2022? Uh, 2023 has been the, the plan, and okay. it's been the plan all along, and yes. How many, uh, how many, what's the current population in hotels? Um, we are in, I have it broken out by, by populations. We are in 83 hotels right now. Okay. Um, well, you don't know how many, how many individuals are? Uh, it's about 11,000. 11,000. And in 83 hotels. 83 hotels. Okay. Um, and that's, so that's at the beginning, at the end of 2023. Correct. Okay. So four years from now. Correct. Um, and that's and that's that number is based on assuming that new capacity will come on in in purpose-built tier two shelters. Is that right, or is it that we're um, anticipating a reduction in census? Um, the premise of turning the tide plan is that we are going to be adding shelters that are much better suited for use as shelter, right? Some of them will be ground up, new construction, purpose-built facilities, and some of them will be more thoughtful, adaptive reuse than we've had in the past, mm -hmm. um, and that that will allow us to get out of the clusters and the hotels that is, is less appropriate capacity. Um, we are on our way on that path. We have opened 30 turning the tide shelters and in, have notified on 60. Great, um, but that is, so at, at, if we were to do all 90 purpose-built shelters as part of the Turning the Tide plan, that would, um, that would allow for all 11,000 families residing, or 11,000 individuals residing in, in commercial hotels to be um, out and to have those contracts closed down? That is our plan, yes. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to see the math on that. You know, I will say, 
a shelter can be 50 units and a shelter can sure. be 200 units. Yeah. And I think that we'll have to look at what, what it is that we are citing and we are happy to continue to work with you on that. Okay, okay. Um, and what's the, what's the budget right now for uh, commercial hotels? Hold on, I have that somewhere. Let me just pull up the number. 463 million. 463. Um, <clears throat> and that's broken down. That's, that's really the lion's share of that is two providers, correct? Uh, th no, there's a number of different providers. I think you're, the families with children is lion's share is two providers, but mm -hmm. there's, there's more in the adults. Okay, side. right, right. Um, okay, now, um, what are the programmatic elements of the hotel contract? What type of services are provided to families? Um, Every, ho every facility has, has housing specialists available. There are, there are um, caseworkers. There are a variety of other um, supports for the clients. I think it is, you know, as you noted in your um, opening statement, these are not facilities that were designed to be used by ex individuals experiencing homelessness. We agree that we should be out of them and that we can provide better services in other facilities. What's the average length of stay? In a hotel, I ha we'll have to get back to you on that. What's the average length of stay for a family? What is that? Uh, just over a year. It's, it's over 400 days, correct? Right. Yes. Right. Um, that's the average. Um, so, you know, my concern with hotels is, um, and if anyone's ever, anyone with kids has ever stayed in a hotel with their kids in a hotel room um, for a night or two or three, um, you know that it gets a little, a little crowded um, and a little cramped uh, after a day or two. And um, just imagine what that's like, uh, 400, plus days um, with a couple of kids, um, very limited amount of services, no place to run around, no kitchens. Right? Do any of the hotel rooms have kitchens? Um, I, don't, I can't say that none of them do, but certainly the majority do not. Mm -hmm. So no place to cook food, right. uh, full-size refrigerators. Council member, I we agree with you that the hotels are not the right place for any individual or family experiencing homelessness. We are, we are actively planning and actively closing capacity in the, in the hotels. That being said, we have a both legal and moral obligation to make sure that we are providing shelter for those who need it. Um, and we cannot overnight increase the better shelter capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so we are gonna continue to use that hotel capacity to make sure that we are meeting that legal and moral obligation. But it is not, the, it is not a good long-term option and we acknowledge that it is not a good long-term option. We'd be uh, more than happy to work with, with you and your colleagues for, to identify more sites for the, the better shelters so that we can pick up the pace on that. Um, we'd be happy to do that. Um, why, why are we not then uh, we have social workers now in, in, all, in every tier two, in every family tier two. Mm -hmm. Correct. Why are they not in hotels? Uh, sorry, hold on. We do have social service staff in the hotels. But not social workers. I, I advocated for that in the budget this year and it was not accepted by OMB. Um, let us follow up with you about that offline. Okay, because I mean, you know, I could just imagine um, the elements of trauma that that child spending 400 plus days in a hotel room without anywhere to go. I mean, there's another issue around um, after school programming, which is that, uh, and tell me if I'm incorrect here, that uh, children in shelter uh, often are unable to uh, partake in after school programming if their school is their kind of school of origin where they, you know, if they stayed in the same school but went into shelter because they can't get transportation home 
uh, after, you know, after an after school program back to the shelter if the shelter's in the Bronx and their home school is in Brooklyn, there's no real way for them to get back to the Bronx because uh, DOE is not gonna provide a bus after school. About 80% of our families are in the same borough as the school of their youngest child. Mm -hmm. um, so we have worked very hard to try and get families located near school, recognizing exactly what you're saying, that, that mm -hmm. school provides an important community. Um, you know, with the larger question of are hotels good places for families to be, mm -hmm. uh, we agree with you. We should, we need to be getting out of the hotels. We have a plan to get out of the hotels. We, um, but given the legal and moral obligation to provide shelter um, and the time that it takes to add quality shelter capacity, we mm -hmm. just can't do it overnight. Mm -hmm. Have we identified how many youth, school-age youth, um, that are residing in hotels are uh, participating in after-school programs? I don't have that number, but it's, we'll look and see if we can do that. Yeah. Um, so I acknowledge uh, Councilors Reynoso and Gibson. Um, has DHS, uh, you know, g given the restraint, the constraints that that uh, are in the hotel setting, um, would DHS consider um, either uh, leasing nearby commercial space to provide um, additional program space, or? Um, additional types of transportation. Um, you know, every every hotel run you know through a DHS contract is in the catchment area of some social service provider. And um, um, as far as I can tell, there's not what I would call a robust relationship between the shelter provider and whatever kind of larger social services program is in that neighborhood. So for example, you know, if uh, in Brooklyn, if it's in Canvas catchment area run by CCS, but CCS doesn't have the contract dollars to provide, you know, uh, a level of um, service that, that probably is warranted What's, what is DHS doing to foster a relationship between C CCS and CAMBA, for example, um, so that the children that are residing in that hotel have the same opportunity for services as a young a child in a CAMBA shelter, for example? So we, uh, for all of our providers, whether it's in hotels or any other setting, we actively encourage uh, links to community-based services simply because there's no way that any facility, any shelter is gonna be able to provide all the programming that anybody could ever need under any circumstance, right? So we, fostering those community relationships is something that we look for across from all of our providers. Um, we also do a lot of work to try and make sure that we are doing uh, cross-training and building peer connections within our, our system. So we bring in all the executive directors to meet and talk together. We bring in shelter directors to meet and talk together, rehousing specialists, things like that. Um, I don't know that we've ever made of uh, the service sharing like that, a particular element of any of those meetings, but it's definitely something that we can look at and explore with you. So if I go to the a CCS shelter, a commercial hotel on Atlantic Avenue, um, and ask the case manager there, who's doing your supplemental or com complementary social services? Where, where's, where are the kids getting um, uh, after school programming, where where is the kind of nearby youth center? Where is um, uh, where is the uh, 
financial counseling or job training, um, they, they'd be able to say, yes, these are the, these, these are, this is the network that this family has to support them? That is our expectation, but we can certainly work with our providers and work with others to make sure that that is happening the way we would like it to happen. Because, mm -hmm. you know, to me what, what I find bothersome is that a family could go into PATH and it's kind of luck of the draw. Um, they could get a placement uh, in a tier two that has um, a lot of funding behind them, uh, has Thrive Social Workers, uh, has um, the ability to uh, raise a lot of private funding, um, and has a network of services, CAMBA, Henry Street, uh, Bronx Works, um, and, um, and so there's a kind of su support network um, with, uh, with that, for that family if they're lucky enough to get that placement. Um, but for the 11,000 individuals that are in hotels, they're placed in you know, a setting that is usually pretty isolated. Hotels are in M zones often. Um, so, there, so there's not, you know, there's nothing really around a hotel in an M zone um, because there's no people there, uh, nobody that lives there. And so, you know, if you're far out on Atlantic Avenue, uh, there's, not, there's not a lot, there's not a lot out there for you. And it's luck of the draw. And and so that's why, in particular, around the social workers, it's not a big deal for the city to say, yeah, we'll provide social workers in every hotel. Um, but for whatever reason, when we proposed it in the budget this year, I made it a, a priority, and it was not accepted by OMB. So just, you know, that is very bothersome to me because those children are already at a disadvantage, already. So the, I was not sitting in this seat during the, during mm -hmm. the budget negotiations. I can certainly follow up and, and educate myself on the history. I hear your point that while we have committed to getting out of the hotels that we need to look at how we are serving those families in the interim. Now, the contract for hotels is up in 2021 and if we're expecting that, the, that we're gonna be out of hotels by the end of 2023, are we going to be, are we anticipating to issue a new contract or are we going to extend the current contract um, or have we, have we thought about that yet? We're still looking at the mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and if, there, if, we're, if we're keeping the current contract, um, are we gonna be looking at enhancements to provide those types of services that a, a, a family at, that's placed at a tier two is able to access? Uh, as I said, we're still looking at the mechanism, but I hear your point and that's something we'll certainly take into account. Um, sorry, and I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues in a second here. I just wanna ask about um, model budgets, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, well, first off, have, have, have we have we gotten feedback from providers what they're what they've thought about the model budget process um, at DHS and um, kind of lessons learned on the model budget process? I'll be honest with you, I, I I heard some feedback over the last couple of years that is like you know less than stellar. So I just wanted to okay. Um, would be certainly would be helpful to to get that in more detail offline. Um, I would say the majority of of the providers have seen an increase in their contracts, and and I think generally that has been well received. Um, we do 
we have to do an amendment for every for every provider that we are putting through the model budget process. That is a contract amendment. Um, that is a there is process, right? And it certainly does take time before the the funds are actually flowing for that. So I think that may be a source of the frustration. Um, but I think we've been able to do a lot of rate rationalization that, from what I've heard anecdotally, has been relatively well received. Um, how many have been? So there's, they've been, they're either approved, uh, sent to the controller, or registered. Do we have a sense of, of ex exactly how many contracts fall into each of those categories? Yeah. So the the total universe under the model budget is 100 and 125 that we are working through for this fiscal year. Um, 16 of them didn't need an amendment because because they were done that way from the get go. Mm -hmm. um, 39 of them are registered, and the remaining, which is about 70, is are still in process. I think one of the issues that that we are wrestling with, and I think we've seen a lot of progress over the last few months, is that. Um, when there is an, are some RSRI issues outstanding, as I mentioned in my testimony, we, we can't send the contract to the controller, can't send an amendment to the contract uh, for amendment, for registration, excuse me. So we've been working very closely with providers. We've seen a lot of progress in getting um, plans in place so that we can move forward with registration, and I think we're going to see a, a solid uptick in those numbers very soon. Okay, th this process began when? Uh, in the spring. The model budget process the, the, began. Do it, putting these FY20 contracts into place began in the spring. Yeah. So, so there was. Bear with me. I'm speaking sure. to history that was not not predated my tenure at DHS, but. Yeah. Um, there was a process of working with the providers. We, we developed the model budget. Mm -hmm. We negotiated individual budgets with providers and got the OMB approval. And then the process of actually getting the, through the registration process, that is something that's for this fiscal year. That's something that started in the spring. Every single one of the providers has an OMB approved model budget. So this, the piece that we are working on right now is the actual registration part component. Okay, I seem to remember, and I'll have to go back and check the record, that, that um, Commissioner Banks testified that, they that we were at, maybe it was during the budget hearings this, earlier this year, that we were very close to every contract being registered. But there's still, there's still two-thirds of the contracts are, are, haven't even been sent to the controller yet, right? Uh, that was a, a broad pending registration number, so some of them are with the controller. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, what I'm sp specifically speaking about is the FY20 amendments to align with the model budget. Um, one of the things- Right, but that's, that's, that's what provides the funding to do absolutely. the model budget uh, absolutely. services. Absolutely. Um, and I, as I say, we've been working very closely with providers and with our facilities and logistics team to make sure that, that we are addressing uh, RSRI issues so that we don't have any barriers to that registration. These are contracts that are already registered, though. I mean, their 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 actual contract is already is already registered. Providers are being paid, and in a number of cases, we've actually been able to align the payment structure so that they are getting paid in accordance with the model budget, and while we are simultaneously registering the contract. So, when I say that that we have all of these registrations in process, this is you should not interpret it to mean that we have. <coughs> all of these providers who are floating the costs of providing uh, shelter services to DHS clients. People are absolutely getting paid, but we have registrations in process to get us all the way to the end of the model budget process. And when do we expect all of the contracts to be registered? Uh, I think we should be over the finish line in the next few months. Okay. So by... Um by our preliminary budget hearing, we expect that every contract amendment for 20 will will have been registered, and we can um, we can uh, toast the completion of the model budget process. I am optimistic that that is the case. I am not going to commit to that 100 percent because there are factors that are outside of our control. Um, we're hearing from 
providers around, uh, if, if there's a new need request that's going in uh, subsequent to the model budget, um, you know, the model budget, by the way, just to be clear, the model budget process began two years ago now? Yes, of course. So um, in that time, uh, into the intervening time, you know, certainly there's, it's anticipated there might be new needs um, brought up. Uh, we're hearing that OMB is, uh, is disapproving any new needs because, uh, because those new needs are not in the model budget. Um, and we're also hearing that um, any new needs um, uh, that are approved are getting um, stuck in, 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 in the queue behind, um, behind the model budget. I don't know that the blanket disapproval is an accurate characterization. I'd s we are going back and reaching out to providers to make sure that new needs that, that may have lingered a little bit um, are in fact still an issue because it may be that actually the model budget has solved some of those. If mm -hmm. they are still an issue, we are processing them and moving forward. Um, you know, con registering the contracts is a, is a process and we are working very closely um, with our partners at the controller's office, um, working with providers, trying to communicate as clearly as possible with providers to make sure that they understand how the different amendments uh, line up with one another. If there's particular cases that you want to send to me for us to follow up on, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, and then, uh, before I, last question here before I turn it over to my colleagues. This isn't really a contract question, but it is all related. And that has to do with, um, with city fest vouchers. You know, in order to get out of hotels, in order to reduce the census so that we're not relying on um, providers that have, um, you know, demonstrated um, uh, inadequate level of service. We're not relying on models like clusters and hotels that are inadequate for uh, children in order to reduce the length of stay uh, to under a year or under nine months. Um, and in order to reduce the census um, so that um, so that families are able to um, get out of a traumatic experience and on with their lives, uh, we need to have a, um, a move-out system that allows families to stay in the five boroughs and, um, and get out of shelter. And I sent a letter last month um, Commissioner Banks requesting some data around city FEPS move outs and uh, how it compares to soda and it's a, it's a whole, whole conversation perhaps for another day but um, if we don't have a, a voucher subsidy that is at fair market rent there is no way that we can expect the shelter to come down the census to come down the length of stay to come down, and any of the things that we want to achieve. This $2.1 billion budget for DHS is going to continue to increase, and it's going to be 2.5 in a couple of years, and it's going to be $3 billion in a few more years, and it's just going to continue to increase on and on and on. The census will stay, I mean, and I give this administration credit because the census has hovered, and we've kept everything kind of in place and it hasn't gotten a lot worse since the mayor took over and that's to his credit. But we're never gonna be able to really turn the corner unless we have a voucher program that pays fair market rent because um, I'm hearing from too many people that have had a shopping letter for city FEPS for a year or two and can't find an apartment for whatever it is, 1515 or 1268 or whatever that amount is and even with the bonuses, the bonuses still don't, there's still the cap on the, on the, on the, on the price of the apartment. Um, and by limiting it to where it is, which is much lower than fair market rent, we are uh, closing the door on a huge percentage of, of the available apartments in New York City. So 
Point well taken, and I think it's something we should talk about going forward. Because it's a wise investment. It's a wise investment, uh, rather than investing more and more hundreds of millions of dollars in the shelter system. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, Councilor Gerdenchik. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, good morning, Commissioner Park. Good morning, other person. I'm sorry, I don't have your name. <laughs> okay, Mr. Drinkwater. Good to see you uh, both. Um, who picks the sites that we select uh, for shelters? Uh, Providers bring us sites typically. We will review them and, and determine whether or not we think they are appropriate for, for shelter and whether or not they align with the turning the tide goals, but the providers are doing the initial site identification. I would generally assume that there are apartment buildings that are either empty or, which is unusual these days, or mostly empty. Uh, it's rarely apartment buildings per se. It's it's um, other kinds of buildings that could be adapted to use for shelter, um, and sometimes it's ground up new construction, um, which obviously takes a lot longer to build uh, to come online and to be able to serve the needs of our clients. But I think has a lot of really exciting potential. Thank you. Um, I th I think that you said before that the budget for homeless hotels um, is $463 million. Is that correct? Uh, I am going to actually clarify. My, my colleague corrected me. It's $486 million for hotels. So it's almost one quarter of the entire budget for homeless services, which I have at $2.1 billion. Um, I have to redo my math. At $463 million, uh, divided by the 11,000 persons that you have there, that's over $42,000 a year per shelter resident in hotels. Is that, we agree on that number? I, I, I will trust your math. All right, my math is usually pretty good. Um, do you have a breakdown on how much we spend on actually providing shelter versus the ancillary services that, you know, such as counseling, you know, all those things that we expect? Um, from our providers. We can follow, follow back up with you on those breakdowns. Okay. I do want to follow up on a hearing that we held here a few weeks ago under the auspices of Chair Levin um, regarding food in homeless shelters. And I have to tell you, I was quite shocked, to put it mildly, to find out that we're only spending $8.40 a day uh, to feed people who live in shelters. and. Um, that's less than two and a half percent of the entire budget for homeless services goes to feeding people. Do you have anything you want to add to that today? Well, one thing that I would clarify is that for the families with children, um, where they have a kitchen, so in all the tier two facilities, um, families are providing their own food. So we we don't provide food in every single shelter. So I just I, I do think it's important to clarify that. And do they buy that food on their own? Is it is there? All right, um, because we, we obviously have to do better. Uh, we heard from quite a few people here who uh, are residents of the shelter system. Um, I was dismayed, to put it mildly, and I hope that, um, you know, it's not that hard. Even I can cook tasty food, so it's really not that hard. But, you know, we have plenty of thousands of establishments in the city that provide tasty food called restaurants. So I would hope that we could do better in the future, and it's something I think we should talk about more as we go forward. Um, and I would appreciate a breakdown um, from the department on where we are with regard to how much we're spending on actual rent and how much we're spending on everything else. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. Uh, Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Deputy Commissioner, uh, 83 hotels, 11,000 people living in them. Uh, how many, what percentage uh, of, of the people ha are families in the hotels? Uh, about half. About half. So 5,500, let's say. Yeah. 5,500 families never having, we heard at the last um, general welfare um, hearing that they never, in the hotels especially, they never have fresh food. They have frozen that they just heat up in microwaves. Is that correct? I, I believe so, yeah. yeah. 
So if the average stays a year, they go a year, kids and families go a year without fresh food. They just have the frozen variety that's in the microwave. Council Member, I think as I said with, to Council Member Levin, we fully believe that the hotels are not the right place and that we, for families or for anybody else experiencing homelessness, we are committed to getting out of the hotels um, and, and I'm happy to look at ways that we can improve the situation for people who are there in the interim. Well, the vouchers sound like, sounds like a good idea. We have apartments going up all over the place and, and um, they, they, they command high rents, but we, we can't find vouchers. We'd rather put people up in hotels with, um, and, and give them microwave food. Um, and it's getting worse, it's getting worse. We're not getting rid of uh, the hotels, we're, we're increasing it. And so the clusters weren't great, but the clusters had kitchens, but they weren't great, but the hotels are better. That's what I never understood. And uh, that should have been put a, a priority on that. But uh, I want to just um, go to another aspect of um, the whole process, the procurement. Now, uh, I've been trying to get a contract from a proposed shelter in my district to see the contract. I wasn't allowed to see it. I had to send somebody, one of my staff members down to view it. And I'm still being denied the contract. I can't see it. At the public hearing um, that was held um, downtown, um, people came. We, we, after we, we looked at the contract, there were several things missing in, in the contract for 7816 Cooper Avenue in Glendale. Uh, blank pages, uh, misinformation, no operating budget, and uh, under um, Section 1-04-D of the New York City Procurement Policy Board rules and the New York City Charter, Chapter 13, the Section 33B, it says, whenever an elected official of the city requests documentation relating to this solicitation or award of any city contract, the mayor and the agency shall promptly provide such documentation. Yet, I've been continuously denied. It is our agency policy and in- Oh, our, your agency policy? It is policy, the contract is available. It is available at Four World Trade. We are happy to make it available to you or anybody else who wishes to see the contract. They haven't done it. I've been asking over and over again. How many times do I have to ask and get denied? It is available at Four World Trade Center. Oh, it's available to look at. I can't have it. Correct. Right, it's okay. Anybody can look at it. Correct. And piece is missing, it's okay. Uh, when it says, um, uh, Commissioner Banks said I'm getting uh, 200 uh, beds, but it says 88 in the contract. Is that an area of concern? Hi. Is it okay, now it is. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah. The contract that we have available for, for public Can you identify inspection. yourself for the record, please? Oh, so, sorry. Uh, my name is Vincent Pulo. I'm the agency chief contracting officer for DSS. Thank um, you. Hold on one second. The uh, committee council will swear you in. I think he, he raised I was hand. sworn in. He, I he did raise my in. hand. He was but I could be sworn in again if you... You're good. Thank you. All right, good. Um, <laughs> the contracts that we have available for inspection, and this is, um, this is a standard... Um, the city policy is that the contracts are in draft. Um, I regret that the draft had um, an incorrect number of beds in it. Um, how, you know, it was a typo. Um, the, the contracts are, are relatively standard um, and our attorneys um, neglected to change the 88 to 200. Um, but the contract is, that that is available for inspections or draft contracts. You know, it's kind of an insult that that DHS can't get their act together. They, they come up with a contract, get the wrong bed, don't even have the right number of beds listed, don't even have the operating budget. So people take their day off to go down and testify, at least, you know, should get the right information. You have to take two days off. You have to go look at the contract, and then you, you have to go back to the public hearing and testify, and there's no information that's really, that you can use or, or gather. You can't trust it. So transparency, are you kidding? DHS, the least transparent agency that I've seen so far in my two years as city councilman. Also, here, here we have um, a hearing, believe it or not, where you just talk to the wall. 
The person that was there from DHS did not say a word. Even the representative from DHS, who's for the borough, was sitting in the back texting, or at least on her phone, not listening to the testimony. The whole thing's a joke. And that's what DHS is treating this whole process. The fact that we couldn't get information, correct information, the budget is, uh, is not even in there, the operating budget, and the person couldn't even answer any questions at the hearing. So I'm sure you're gonna say that's our policy. But getting, it's in the charter that I'm supposed to get a copy of, of the, I'm supposed to have that available to see and to, and to have a copy of it. Even though it's a draft, what's the problem with giving city council members a copy of the contract? What is the problem? Is that, is that um, something's gonna come crashing down that the agency will, will cease to exist if we get a copy of a draft contract? Um, I don't interpret the rule that way. However, what, what we will do is we will go back, look at the rule, and to see uh, whether or not it can be provided. Um, as I mentioned, it is a draft. Um, as contracts are, are more fully negotiated, um, they, are, they are certainly subject to the Freedom, freedom of Information Law. Um, however, during the draft contracting process, we do, we do strictly abide by by, by having the contracts available for inspection. Um, and then when, when we do have a public hearing, um, the person that is holding the public hearing is a procurement official, and that person is not the appropriate person to answer during, during the public hearing. However, we do take every comment uh, back, and we do receive the uh, minutes of the public hearing, and we do speak with pro programs. Can, can you tell me any comments that were said during the uh, hearing? Well, there were a number of comments during. No, but can you give me one? You say you, you listen to it, you take it back. Who's who's listening to it, and who's well, taking it? Well, I was not there. It was it, it was one of my deputies. But if I remember, there was a lot of um, testimony from the community with regards to the process and. Um, there were complaints um, that, um, with regards to where the building is located and the population. Um, I, I'm sh sh you know, when we, pr when we go back to, to final award, and during the course of the whole um, process, we do, we do look at, we do look at the testimony, and we, and we do consider the testimony, and we have on many, uh, on many this, shelters. This, to me, this sounds like it's just um, bureaucratic mumbo-jumbo, once again, that people listen, and nobody's listening, nobody's paying attention in DHS, nobody get, I don't get feedback, I get, I call the commissioner, I don't get a call back. I've been, I've been dealing with this site for uh, over, well over a year. We, we tried to come up with alternate locations, we did, he liked it, the commissioner said, uh, and yet, um, again, the rug was pulled out at, at the 11th hour. Uh, this is an inappropriate location. I gave four of the locations. I tried to, I set up a couple of homeless shelters uh, using uh, city council uh, money initiatives. However, um, there's, there's, a, there's a feeling in that, at least I have, and I think some other council members, they can speak for themselves, but that DHS does not want to work with us. Uh, and we all said that we need to at least get a heads up, have a seat at procurement, not, a veto, not veto power, but at least get, give some feedback as to better locations within the community, uh, better, you know, it, it'll, it would fit more into the community. Yet, um, I, I, I got like um, the agency circling the wagons uh, last winter. When I was working every day with, uh, uh, with DHS, we were looking at other locations. I had proposals for faith-based shelters, smaller shelters. In my community, in many communities around the city, 200-person shelter is not going to fit into a one and two family area. It'll never be accepted. Yet, and I said, I'll set up smaller ones, we'll work it out. No, it's not cost effective, it's not this, it's not that. Yet, the, at the last hearing, we heard nightmare stories about, oh, listening to your, t your testimony, it's, it's like this kumbaya, this is a wonderful, these, these are wonderful shelters. That's not what we heard at the last hearing. With the food, with the conditions, how they dehumanize people, how, how they interact. We're not, hearing, we're not hearing that from the population, the clients that, that you um, uh, supposedly support. But it, we're on, the, on the neighborhood level, there's, there's no willingness to work with um, the community. 
there's dictate from the mount, that they're gonna just keep telling us what we need and what we can have in our communities, yet they don't wanna work with the council members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Holden. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank and, you, so And, and uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, we're gonna place members on a five minute clock, if that's okay. Well, that makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming to testify today. Uh, thank you, chairs, for the five minutes. Um, I, I want to ask a few broad questions and then one quick question about a specific incident in a shelter in my district. Um, overall, do you have caseworker ratios, caseworker to client ratios in shelters, and are they different based on the type of shelter that is uh, that it is, and are they available 24/7? Uh, yes, we have specific ratios. Yes, they vary by different population type. Um, there are, is always programmatic staff on, there's always staff on site 24 seven. Security. There's, there's, there's always security staff and there are, are programmatic staff that can be accessed at, at different hours and we do try and make sure that, that there are different shifts covered. Um, you know, is there a, caseworker available routinely at three o'clock in the morning? In, in most cases, no, but if there's a... I have five minutes. Sorry. If there's, it's a, if there's a specific instance that you wanna ask about, we can, we can certainly talk about that. I think what I'd like is if you could get back to the committee with the um, ratios certainly. for each of the different types of shelters. Absolutely. And then uh, for each of the types of shelters, who's the on-call staff when? Of course. Certainly. Does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, because, um, all right, great. And then uh, for clients who are working during the business day, who do have jobs, which many of your clients do, yes. how do they access the caseworkers? So we, we look to make sure that the caseworkers cover more than just the nine to five time slot. So there's, there will be some staff who are available earlier in the day, some who are there later. Um, we would also, in, you know, for people with, with very irregular schedules, we would encourage them to talk to their shelter director, talk to their talk to the staff on site and to make alternative arrangements, but we understand that we are operating a 24-7 system and, and look to meet clients' needs. Can you show us, can you again send over information to say, I don't care about the specific shelters, but sort of, you know, here are the shelters where caseworkers are needed in the evening and, and, and it's, it's 10, and we have caseworkers there from 5 to 10 p.m. every day. Something like that to indicate where the need is and where the demand is um, being met. Sure, I have to think about what would be the most appropriate data, but we will follow up with you. And if we don't get exactly what you're looking for the first time, we will continue to work with you. I mean, that. I think we're looking for an honest reflection of what's available for clients. And if there are holes, right, if there are places that don't have coverage that need it, as a council member, I would prefer that you be upfront about that Certainly. and just show us, look, there are these five, five programs that we just don't have coverage for. And we are either because of vacancies or because of the lack of funding. And here's what we're doing to try to fix it. Certainly. Okay. Um, uh, Chair, can I have, yes. thank you very yes. much. Yes, yes, yes. Um, are you looking at any, to pilot any new initiatives for children in um, homeless shelters to find um, additional modes or, or different ways to get at mental health issues? Um. Well, first of all, let me say we're always open to ideas. So if you have some, a specific program you want to look at, want us to look at, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we, we have invested a lot in our Families with Children system to try and make sure that we are meeting children's needs in, a, in addition to families' needs 
uh, in totality. Um, I think the, the investment of Thrive Social Workers in the Families with Children system has been a really important investment in that direction. Um, and then uh, I, we also have a, a partnership with um, some philanthropic partners and, the, and other city agencies to do um, sort of train the trainer initiative to do early childhood education around brain development to making sure that we are helping what are often very young mothers um, know how to, to help their kids grow and develop. So yes, it is something that's very important to us. Great, and I know the Children's Museum does some of that work, and mm -hmm. you know, one of the museums in my district, and they're really right. proud of that work. It's extraordinary, I've seen it. But again, how many, child how many shelters do you have with families in them? Um, our, wonder in all the vast quantity of information I brought I'm not sure I have that one that particular stat specifically um, but about uh, half of our or sorry two-thirds of our shelter clients are families with children um, and we can certainly so get the number what I'm getting at is again if you could let us know uh, how many shelters have children yeah. in them and how many have a program like CMOM sure absolutely okay um, again, looking for being very honest about where you don't and sort of what you're doing to fill in with social workers from Thrive, maybe right. that's what's going on there, and maybe you could categorize uh, the shelters by what type of um, program is providing that emotional and mental health service. I will say all the families with children shelters, tier two shelters, have social workers. So the, the social workers is an across the board um, standpoint where there are uh, enrichment programs like a I'm looking for the, the enrichment museum. programs okay. that really. that will probably take us a little longer to pull together because that is often done led by the nonprofit provider as opposed to led by DHS but we can certainly do that for you okay that'd be great um, lastly is there a formal grievance process for clients who have a complaint with anything is there some place, um, you know, uh, are they told as part of, you know, welcome to the shelter, here's FAQs, roles and responsibilities, something like that. Yes. Here's where you can complain either on site or online or something. Yes, um, so we have an ombudsman office. The number for that is given out um, when somebody comes into shelter um, and is it's posted in shelters as well. And that is that is the where people are directed for it. Okay, is it posted in every single shelter? Uh, I'm gonna need to confirm that and get back to you. Okay, I mean, just a good note to self, I'll, I'll keep mind of it when I'm looking at my shelters, maybe others can do so as well. We just wanna make sure that that's posted really clearly. Lastly, um, there was an incident, horrible incident, of course, in one of the shelters in my district, and um, I spoke with a shelter provider who asked for, um, one thing mainly as a solution. Of course, this is a situation where um, uh, two men who were rooming together and, and uh, um, had a, 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 a dispute over an issue that uh, wasn't uh, something that may have risen to the attention of the caseworkers on site, but got out of hand and, and someone was killed. Um, uh, the shelter provider is asking for two things. One, that there be cameras um, with uh, voice abilities to uh, walk up shelter, and there was security on site, but they weren't on the fourth floor. The neighbors didn't really hear it or know what was going on until it was too late. So they're asking for cameras with audio. Um, and they're asking for um, a metal detector because of course one of the, the clients had a pocket knife. Um, I'm wondering what you think about those requests and whether or not, yeah, just sort of what the thinking is on requests like that and whether or not that's an option for other shelters as well. And that's my last question, okay. thank um, you. Certainly things that we can look at. I'm not gonna comment too much on the specific case given that it is still under formal investigation. Um, you know, I think with the, I think that is, first of all, it's a, a good example of a, 
of a building that is being used for purposes that it is less than ideally suited for, to have two men together and in a small room is, is, is less than ideal um, and speaks to the goals that we have um, about reforming the shelter system, about improving the physical capacity that we have. Um, you know, with, if we're thinking about, you know, cameras with audio, I want to make sure that we are balancing safety needs with also in, intrusion into people's privacy concerns, but it's something we can look at. Okay. I'm sorry, and what did, I just couldn't hear. Did you say something about a um, metal detector when uh, people I'm walk? Sorry, I did not respond on that one. It's also something we'll, we'll take a look at, sure. Is that at any other facilities? Do you we have do metal have facilities with metal detectors, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, Chair, Member if I can just uh, correct the record, uh, earlier when Councilmember Holden was discussing the Cooper Avenue site and the contract, just a reminder that it is a draft contract. However, this agency has been very public in the fact that that is going to be a proposal for a 200-bed men's shelter run by a very reputable provider, West Hab. Um, and this agency has participated in any number of meetings with the council member and his community about that location. Okay. Um, okay, turning it over to Councilmember Barron for questions. Uh, thank you to both the chairs and to the panel for coming. There, as you probably well know, is Help USA located in my district, and they submitted a request, uh, HPD submitted a request that the existing shelter be demolished and a new shelter be built and additional housing as well. The community resisted that and we were able to gratefully come to a, an adjustment where the new housing that will be developed on that site, which is far more extensive than just the 200 units, will be in fact for affordable, family, affordable to families who live in my community where the AMI is about 30% of what the city's AMI is. And there will be housing for 200 families that had formerly been in shelter to now be embedded in the housing that will be constructed. So we believe that as we, and the council I believe is gonna consider uh, legislation to talk about having a minimal number, increasing that number significantly to make sure that it includes opportunities for families that were present, that were formerly in shelters to move into permanent housing. What is your response to that, which also gets at uh, some of the points about having a voucher system that in fact matches what the rates are for housing so that people who are in temporary shelters will be able to move out of shelter. And of course we recognize the governor and the state ended the Advantage program, which greatly contributed to the increase in uh, those needing shelter. I've spent most of my career in affordable housing. Could you I've, pull the mic a little closer? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I've spent most of my career in affordable housing. I am a tremendous believer in, in the need for affordable housing and the power of affordable housing for communities. Um, and, and so I'm, I am never going to denigrate additions to the affordable housing stock because I believe it's really important. That being said, um, I also think it's really important that we have high quality, nonprofit owned and operated shelter. Um, the reality of, of our larger socioeconomic system, and this is, goes well beyond DHS, but about you know, given levels of income inequality and given the nature of the real estate market in, in New York City, some of the statistics that I cited early in my testimony, um, means unfortunately that I believe we are gonna to need to continue to serve families with children and others in temporary shelter um, while we help them transition to permanent housing. So while affordable housing is a critically important part of the equation and, and I am you know, enthusiastic about all of the ways that we as a city can invest in permanent housing and affordable housing development, um, I, I hope that we can do it in ways that doesn't come in at expense of the shelter system because for all of the reasons that we have talked about, about the need to get out of hotels, we can only do that if we have high quality shelter that we can, can use in the interim. So how are we, you know, in the interim, how, how long do you project this interim to be? 
I, I mean, you know, the Turning the Tide Plan, which is our guiding document, um, as you, I'm sure, are well aware, had a relatively small reduction in the shelter census that is contemplated. Um, we are actually doing relatively well against that goal about holding, and we are holding the shelter census steady. Um, I am anxious to work with, with the council, with my colleagues. We should absolutely be looking for ways that we can reduce the shelter census over the long term. But what we have seen is that, you know, despite the fact that we, have, we as an administration have placed 125,000 people in permanent, subsidized permanent housing placements, people then come in to the system, right? So we have oh, an okay. ongoing need for shelter. Okay, I'm gonna shift a little bit. In terms of the contracts that are given to um, these not-for-profit organizations, have we looked at what percentage of those contracts actually goes to salaries of those who are in the leadership of the uh, organizations requesting? What percentage goes, we know it all goes back. People love to say, oh, it's not-for-profit. Yes, that's fine. What percentage goes to the salaries of those persons who are at the top? I'm not talking about the social workers and the case workers. We know that that's a general range. Right. Uh, I don't have that data at hand. I will talk to my colleagues and figure out if that is something that we can produce in one way or another. We'll follow that. Why would it be a problem? I, I, I don't know if we have the, the data to be able to do it. If you have to submit a contract and if you have to identify the budget, why couldn't you identify that readily? It's part of the indirect rate. It's part of the indirect rate. So it's during the course of time. So it goes back up to the indirect rate. So it's cash. Uh, we should be able to produce some data great. on that. That would be grateful. Uh, be very grateful for that. In terms of visiting a uh, shelter, what's the protocol for any of the council members to have a visit at a shelter? You can contact my office and we'd be happy to set that up. So it has to be prearranged through your office? Yes. You can't just stop in? We prefer you to set it up through my office. But can you just stop in? You can stop in. Again, we prefer it to be set up through my office. Okay. And in terms of the, um, what is it called, the RSRI, the Routine Site Review Inspection, who are the panelists or who are the members of that team who conduct that inspection? So DHS has inspection staff that, that does the RSRI. What are their qualifications or their background? Um, they are... I'm going to need to follow up with you on that one. I'm sorry, I don't okay. have that at my fingertips. But then we also do regular inspections with the shelter repair squad, which is made up of HPD inspectors, FDNY inspectors, building inspectors, uh, health and mental hygiene. OK, great. Thank you to the chairs. Can I clarify just one thing? Yes. So um, our providers, uh, our shelters are not you know, public locations. And right. so if an individual were to come to the shelter, they would be an unauthorized guest. Um, and so that's why we prefer that uh, visit to be set up through my office so that doesn't occur and we can have a seamless uh, visit to the shelter. And then how, what kind, what's the length of time that it would take for that request to be considered? It's considered immediately and scheduling is just around staff schedules. And scheduling, I didn't hear you. Staff scheduling and availability. Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Chair Kalos, and thanks to both you and, and Chair Levin for convening this important hearing, and, and thanks to both of you for your long work on these issues. Um, uh, first, I just want to like associate myself with the importance of the questions at getting at shelter conditions, doing everything we can to assure really strong, decent living conditions, um, obviously so critical at, at this time of year and always. Um, I will say I was just Thursday night at the Camba Women's Shelter in my district at the Park Slope Armory for just like a gorgeous holiday party. And if you didn't watch the little snippet on my Twitter feed, go back and watch it. They threw just like the most beautiful uh, Christmas party, and I think it'll probably be your holiday party. And I think probably the nicest of the holiday parties that I go to uh, this season. Boy, a lot more heartfelt than some of the other ones. So there is a way to do and provide and partner with shelter that is about our deep compassion for helping people and like what are the folks in the shelter want like 
On the one hand, it was, this is a, a, a place that's building beautifully to help strengthen people's skills and build in partnership. And on the other hand, what do people want? They want housing. Of course, that's the gift they want for the season. And both those things can be true. And we have to hold them together. We must do everything we can to create pathways to permanent, supportive, and other housing out of the shelter system. But at the same time, we must do everything we can to build together with nonprofits and the agencies and the shelter providers to provide the kind of uh, shelter where you'd not only want to live, but you'd be happy to go to a holiday party. Um, and I know we can, because I was just there Thursday. Um, <clears throat> you guys are rightly uh, bringing some additional shelters to my district and, and my part of Brooklyn, and that is absolutely the right approach under the Turning the Tide plan. The fair share goal of making sure that all communities do their part is absolutely critical. I think it goes hand in hand with high, you know, engaging high quality operators to provide high quality shelter and uh, convert the system so that the spaces it has had that are not high quality are removed and replaced with high quality places with high quality partners fairly spread and shared throughout the city. So uh, that is why I've stepped up to be a, a supportive partner um, in the sightings, which are now I think up to four in my, in my district uh, in the last year, one of them shared with Council Member Levin. But I guess I do want to ask a contracts question because for absolutely correct and right reasons, the rent in Park Slope is high. And if you are going to contract for a shelter in Park Slope, it is gonna cost more than a shelter that would be in East New York. So we have to pay that price if we want to have a, a fair sharing and high quality in the city. Um, that is what a lot of people have asked questions about. I think some people who you know, uh, frankly, are, are expressing nimbyism, have learned rather than saying, I don't want a shelter next door, have learned to say the cost is outrageously high. And the problem is the cost is outrageously high. Um, so I guess I want to ask a couple of questions here. Um, one of which is just how you think about that problem, like how as, as managers of a budget and people who believe in fairness, how you're thinking about and approaching how you negotiate with people, how much you try to get the price down, how much you say we got to pay what the market is if we want to be spread equally throughout the city. But then more deeply, I'd like to think long term about how we make this more of a, a resource. And I, I put my cards on the table publicly before, but I'll do it here. I would feel better about the price we're paying if I thought we were really gaining a public asset. So if these were purchases, I would do it by eminent domain, I would do it by contract and public purpose. I don't mind it being a shelter for as long as it needs to be a shelter to provide it, but someday when we've gotten the shelter census down and it could instead be affordable housing, we really need that in my neighborhood as well. So how, what are some opportunities, I guess, how do you think about balancing the challenges of price and fair sharing? And what could we be doing to think about this as a long-term asset and not just a, a short-term emergency we've got a responsibility to solve? Absolutely. Um, so to take the, the first piece of the question, when we are looking at a, at a particular proposal, um, we do recognize that if we want to be in, located in neighborhoods all across the city, we're going to have to be willing to pay rents that align with neighborhoods all across the city. Um, it is in some ways an expensive proposition, but it is, I think, the right thing to do with respect to making sure that we have shelter that is distributed from all the communities where people come from, that we, and we have shelters that are located with access to all of the amenities and neighborhood amenities that um, everybody else expects to have access to. Agreed. So, you know, we certainly negotiate, we look at comps, we do everything that we can to make sure that we are getting an appropriate deal for the neighborhood, but we do recognize the neighborhood differential. Um, and then on the longer term question, I entirely share your goals. Um, I think one of the things that is exciting for me and that I th that the agency has been working really hard to develop is what we are referring to as our, our now I'm going to get a little wonky, our debt service contracts, which are longer term contracts where the, the, um, the contract includes rather than rent to an uh, provide to an existing landlord, actually the debt service payments to either acquire or build um, the build the building from scratch. Um, the these are going to be only available to not for profit controlled housing development fund corporations. Um, they are going to have long term use requirements attached to them. 
Um, and it's going to be a way that we can make sure that when the city is investing in these high quality buildings that we have a way to control it for the long term. Um, this was, you know, part of, the, it was mentioned briefly in Turning the Tide is that we were going to do 25 of these purpose built shelters. Um, I think it is, and, and we are making good on that. We have a few in the pipeline and are, I think, even more importantly, putting out structures and programs so that we have uh, you know, readily available tools for the real affordable housing real estate industry to use so that we are investing in that kind of high quality facility. Are any of those far enough along that they've, there's public information on them? Can we learn a little more about them? Um, well, unfortunately, the, the Blake site was, was one of those. Um, so, so I will not talk about that one. Uh, we should have others that are ready to, to be public on fairly shortly, and I'd be happy to follow up with you at that point. Okay, I would, I would really like to learn more and, and. Okay, and that speaks to just what, you know, whether there's just a plan to acquire them in nonprofit ownership or whether there's this model of partnering shelter and, and supportive or permanent housing either way would be I, great. I think learn. there's absolutely opportunity for doing more co-located shelter and, and permanent housing. I think we have a couple of very um, significant flagship projects like that. The, the one that's most often cited is the Landing Road project in the Bronx, which is a terrific example. There's a um, Wish Fish project on 108th Street that is in construction right now, but I think there's a lot of smaller scale options too that are really exciting um, that I'd be happy to, to talk through with you. Which is great. And then I just, for our long-term thinking, and I'll, I'll, this will be my last question, I, I, I you know, for reasons that make sense, those tools are going to be easier to imagine being executed in lower priced parts of the city. And I want to think about how we do it in the higher priced parts of the city as well, um, because I want to be able to keep leaning in and supporting. But as you know, it's like a real challenge on, the, on a couple of the ones in the neighborhood where what, what people perceive in the neighborhood is here's a for-profit private real estate developer who aimed to build whatever they could with very, as little affordability as they could, and then they built the thing, and then they made a calculus as they're just about to go to market. Hey, maybe the city will make it, you know, either pay me a little better or pay me the same, but it's easier for me. And, and I want, we need, we need the shelter bed, so I'm, I'm supporting them. But then, you know, there's some sticker shock in watching what we're paying. And then if it's just a rent for however long, then at the end of that time, we're going to hand them back this building we paid them all that rent for. So, I mean, it probably doesn't help you cite more shelter systems to have me, like, threatening eminent domain to take <laughs> those buildings after you contract with them and bring them into nonprofit ownership so that they could become permanent affordable housing after the time that they serve their purposes as shelters. But I, I want us to keep pushing to think of some way because if we're spending rightly the people's money on this moral and legal obligation to house homeless people in a fair and decent way all across the city as we should, let's push ourselves harder to do everything we can to make sure it's used to kind of keep acquiring and retaining and building social assets and not just kind of renting that space to provide those services in ways that just you know largely also wind up having that big benefit to the to private access. I agree well. entirely. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that we were joined by Council Member Torres. Uh, how come Brad gets homeless shelters and I don't? Can I, can I get more than he is? Uh, we would be happy to work with you on citing some shelters. Uh, that, that being said, um, I, I know that you recently started, but I did provide, I believe, four addresses for uh, Commissioner Banks to provide homeless shelters in my district, uh, and we are willing to do rezonings to make it so, so I actually have been waiting for uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to make it happen, and uh, a response from the city on whether or not we can provide the additional. Apologies, uh, I wasn't aware about that, but we will absolutely follow up. <laughs> uh, I also want to uh, thank the Mayor's Office of Contract Services for being present at the uh, hearing today to provide uh, any uh, questions on call, uh, and I just want to uh, mention that uh, following Councilmember Holden's uh, question relating to contracts, uh, in our role in the Contracts Committee, we've requested more than a dozen contracts, uh, which those dozens of requests have resulted in us getting several dozen contracts per request 
We are at something like 3.6 gigabytes worth of contracts that we've received from the city thus far. Uh, and so we did have a quick sidebar with uh, Mox and uh, the ACO for DHS and Councilmember Holden that we will get a, a definitive answer within the next uh, 24 hours. And I just appreciate working with folks and um, just to give a little bit of credit, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services has given us, the, given, given this committee the documents within uh, 10 days. Uh, any time we've asked it, which is under the uh, charter mandate, and it is a tool we have been using. Uh, question for DHS is just around how you evaluate providers and maintain quality. Uh, what metrics do you use to measure your return on investment? Are the number of violations a factor? Uh, the chair was talking a little bit about length of stay. Another possible metric could be the effectiveness of job training and job placement. Uh, another metric could be successful placement in housing. Uh, can, we, can, redu can we use sub objective measures to reduce contracts with bad providers and expand contracts with good providers? We are 100% supportive of the overall goal. Implementation of that is something that's extremely complicated because the households that we serve are operating in a larger system of, of services and needs, right? So when a, when a family comes to us and, and their primary obstacle to moving out is, is a mental health issue, for example, right? DHS can help with connection to mental health services, but at the end of the day, we are not the public health agency, and so we are, we are working with colleagues to make sure that people are getting connected to services. Um, in terms of measuring one particular shelter provider against another, um, you know, if you have, you could have two families with children shelters, each of 100 units, it looks like on paper that they are serving very similar populations, but if one building is primarily one bedroom units and it's you know a mom and a baby and the other shelter has a whole bunch of three bedroom units and you have you know five six seven person families in them um, there those obstacles that people have to moving out are, are different and more complicated so um, yes we are we we are tremendous consumers of data we are thinking a lot about where where we're seeing success um, and challenges and how we can help different providers um, meet the challenges that face them. But I, I do want to be careful about doing, making the comparisons that are, um, might seem appropriate, but actually have a little bit more nuance to them. I think any qualitative measures, the shelter report provides metrics. Uh, any more metrics that you can make public would be very helpful. And we would love to also see those measured in uh, when you grant new contracts or increase budgets. Uh, in my district, I founded the Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services, where we work with churches, synagogues, nonprofits, city agencies to improve service develop, delivery to the homeless and many residents who are just frankly insecure, food insecure. Uh, we also focus on doing uh, specific and special outreach to uh, specific individuals in need who have been chronically homeless for as long as I can remember, even going back to when I was in high school. Uh, frequently when we hear from the chronically homeless, they, they feel safer on the street than they do in shelters, uh, and, and in particular shelters that are contracted by DHS. Where safety is the primary concern, does DHS place additional scrutiny over providers when, uh, such as like in the Acacia situation where the contracts are with a related for-profit security company, uh, and then similarly, how can DHS ensure that contracted providers are able to address safety concerns? There's a lot in there. Let me try and, and break up some of the pieces. So specifically with Acacia, um, we have been working, as I noted earlier, very closely with them to make sure that they are in compliance with all of the procurement rules. One of the things that we are requiring and that they have agreed to under the terms of their cap is that they divest themselves of their affiliated security company. So that will be done by the end of the calendar year. Um, so I think that is that is something that we are doing that we are moving forward with, um, with 
respect to individuals who are um, unsheltered, experiencing unsheltered homelessness, right, who are, who are living on the street. Um, certainly this concern about safety, about coming indoors is, is something that we have heard a lot. Um, a, a tool that we have to address that is, is safe havens. These are a form of, um, of transitional housing for individuals who meet chronic, uh, definitions of chronic homeless street homelessness. Um, and they provide a, a more, a, a lower key setting, right? Fewer rules, um, smaller spaces, and, and that has been a very successful tool for helping to get people indoors. With lengths of stay that can exceed a year, is DHS registering residents to vote at shelters or mandating that residents of DHS contracted shelters are getting registered? And do you think that if every single resident of a shelter was registered to vote, they might be getting, they might get different treatment? Yes, we are registering people to vote. Including at the sites that at, are? At, at shelters, yes. Um, including the independently operated? Yes. Okay, um, great. No, it is not a mandate that anybody register to vote. That's fine. Um, and um, I'd like to believe that people's needs would be met whether or not they vote or not, but I, you know, I, I can't say speak to that. That, that is a, a fair uh, answer to a, a tough question. Uh, one of the things we've talked to providers about, particularly with regard to the cluster data we've been talking about, is that oftentimes a nonprofit shelter operator may not own the building and may not be even empowered to make a lot of these repairs. How does the city support providers in clearing violations in buildings outside of their control? Similarly, um, how can we work to hold the landlords accountable? So in a typical resident situation, you might pay for everything but your rent because your landlord isn't making necessary repairs. Uh, so could the city allow service dollars to flow to the providers while withholding funding from the building owner as a, a way to incentivize the re uh, receipts with repairs without harming services. The structure of our contract mechanism doesn't allow that right now. Um, it's something that I'd be happy to explore with with colleagues at Mox. Um, you know, we we certainly provide a lot of technical assistance, um, working with our providers and coordinating with landlords so that we are making sure that that building conditions are getting addressed. Um, and I do want to be very clear that when we, with the RSRIs and the corrective action plans that are associated with the RSRIs, what we are looking for is a clear and well-documented plan that the conditions are going to be addressed, right? So a contract with the plumber, for example. Um, we understand that some repairs take more time and that, frankly, the nonprofit is going to need the money to contract with the plumber to get the repair done. So um, it's the plan we're looking for to register the contract, not the actual repair itself. Now, if the repair doesn't then follow, then, then the next time we're gonna have a problem. I'm taking over for uh, Chair Kills. Um, so I, I actually have uh, a couple of uh, additional questions uh, that I wanted to ask before turning it back over to uh, Council Member Holden. Um, uh, you mentioned safe havens. Um, uh, I believe, and I think a lot of other people believe it as well, um, that safe havens are key um, to reducing the unsheltered population sleeping on the street or in the subways. Um, I am not supportive of Outreach NYC. I don't think that it is putting the resources in the right um, place. I agree with the um, outreach workers, the anonymous outreach workers that wrote in Gothamist the other day, um, which was that if we don't have housing for people, um, that there's nothing that an outreach worker can really do other than just visit somebody that has been visited any number of times by any number of outreach workers. 
Uh, it's not as if we don't know where people are. Um, we need to be able to offer them something. And if you talk to um, anyone that is um, sleeping on the street, as Josh Dean, who's here, has done and documented, um, you know, 80% would uh, accept a safe haven placement, and 80% would reject going through the, the, the traditional 30th Street, um, Bedford Armory, Franklin Avenue route. Um, and that's just a fact. I mean, you know, everybody I talk to, uh, if I'm on the train or in, the, in Grand Central or on the street, uh, it's not as if they don't know that uh, Ward's Island is, a, is an option for them. They know that. Um, they don't want to go there. Um, but they'll go to a safe haven. So, um, I don't know if you saw um, uh, recently the um, Human Services Council had rated the, um, the safe haven RFP in terms of how they advise their membership or, uh, organizations um, in terms of the riskiness of, the, of responding to the RFP in terms of the contract. And they, they put it at a high risk contract to, to respond to. They put it at 67%. Um, and I mean, I can read to you um, uh, what they said. Um, and it's, it's just concerning because, uh, I, actually, I think it's, I would like to read this into the record anyway, so I'll do that. Um, the risk profile uh, is 67%, which makes this RFP a moderate to substantial risk for applicants. The background is that this request for proposal is for the development and operations of safe haven for chronic street homeless adults and or adult couples without minor children. Utilizing a housing first approach, this resource is provided to the chronically street homeless individual, to chron the chronically street homeless individual who has historically not accepted other placement options. The goal of this RFP is to provide chronic street homeless adults referred by street and subway outreach teams a safe place to sleep and various on-site services that will improve the cli client's standard of living and obtain more permanent housing. Quote, safe havens will be flexible in working with the variety of behaviors and situations a chronically street homeless client may present. Some of these may include, but are not limited to, Hoarding, lack of personal hygiene, self-isolation, self serious mental illness, substance use disorder, including alcohol and opioid dependence, and injection drug use. And medical conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cellulitis, poor, deten poor detonation, um, infestation with lice and uh, or other parasites or ailments of the fee that need to be addressed. The New York City Department of Homeless Services is the contracted contracting agency, and this is an open-ended solicitation proposal submitted will be reviewed by DHS on an ongoing basis. Key concerns, inadequate funding. DHS anticipates <laughs> funding safe havens at an overall per client per night cost of $110 or less. DHS prefers a safe haven with a rent per diem of less than $35 per client per night and a non-rent per diem, parentheses, inclusive of all PS and OTPS costs, close parentheses, of $75 or less per client per night. Preferences, preferences may be given to providers who bring buildings with lower rents. With this rate, and that's close quote, with this rate, providers must provide full on-site medical services, nutritious meals, in compliance with the NYC food guidelines, and a community advisory board. At $110 per client or less, applicants are unlikely to be able to meet the program deliverables without subsidizing the contract substantially with other revenue given the high cost of rent in New York City. This RFP states that, quote, DHS also reserves the right to incorporate additional services into, safe, into the safe haven, including but not limited to an increase in program size, redu reduction of the per diem rate, or the imposition of financial disincentives if a program fails to meet program targets set by the DHS, close quote. This is a risk for applicants because they need to ensure that they have enough resources to sustain the program in case DHS can, <coughs> excuse me, decreases funding at any time or increases the program size during the contract. Additional concern, lack of cost escalators. The RFP is a five-year contract with one four-year renewal option, meaning providers could potentially receive the same rate for nine years. Nonprofits struggle to meet rising costs as rates on contracts are not increased from, one, from year to year to address an increase in the cost of delivering services. 
With the current underfunding of homeless services programs, it is crucial that DHS include cost escalators in their contracts. Potential risks for new proposers. The RFP is vague in providing enough information for new contractors to make an informed decision about proposing to develop and implement safe havens. There are many additional variables that proposers should consider before submitting a proposal. For instance, programs must be able to accept clients within two months of the contract start date, unless you have the resources to not only procure an appropriate building while meeting Department of Building requirements, but also for building out the specific space you need, including outdoor space for pets, and acquiring all necessary staff, it is impossible to start the program on time. It takes an enormous amount of time to find, secure, and negotiate the property, particularly at the rates provided. In addition to the facility requirements, a quote, system for recording and tracking all maintenance and repair functions, close quote, is required and will likely call for an additional investment. Potential bidders should be prepared to both manage the operation and budget of safe havens at a very lean rate while also having the expertise, capacity, and resources to work with a variety of behaviors and issues that chronically homeless individuals may experience. Similarly, because this is an open-ended RFP and DHS reserves the right to discard proposals to ensure the geographical distribution or funding availability, new contractors should be aware that they may be eliminated due to factors beyond their control. Proposers should also consider the requirement to notify the community of building a potential shelter and need for DHS site approval before opening shelters, which could delay the reward of a contract. Um, it would be helpful if there were more transparency in the number of units developed and accounted for so that not-for-profits are cognizant of any funding that is left through this RFP and can make a more informed decision about the likelihood that funding might be available should they decide to submit a bid. I know that was long-winded. I wanted to get that into the record because, um, as I think a lot of people see, safe havens are absolutely essential. Um, with an appropriate geographical distribution um, to reducing uh, the number of people that are living on the street. We know that. We know, we know what works, um, but if HSC is saying, you know, high risk, it's red, the thermometer there, 67%, um, it, obviously that dissuades providers um, or has the, um, I think, the effect of dissuading providers from, from applying for this RFP. And if we can't get enough, I mean, right now we, d we don't have a, a lot of excess capacity in our safe havens. If we want to bring on more capacity, um, we need to be able to, um, to work with the provider community to make sure that they f feel that the risks are, are manageable enough. Uh, fair. I think we are very committed to safe haven capacity. We have about 350 units in the pipeline right now. Um, we've also been looking at what our budget standard should be for safe havens so that I, I think we can be responsive to some of that. Okay. Because I just don't want to get too far along. I mean, it's a rolling RFP, right? Yeah. So um, so then that can be amended at any time? Or is, how does the, how would, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, a safe haven's gone, does that have to go through its own Model budget amendment, or what's the? We we are working on a model budget for safe havens. The we, mm -hmm. we don't have one right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, with respect to the RFP, it depends a bit on on what we ultimately decide we need to do. If there's some minor tweaks, we can work with the form that we have, or pot you know potentially we'll look at something broader. And mm -hmm. and it's too early at this point to say which route we're going to go. I would I would recommend sitting down with the umbrella organizations, whether it's HSU. HSC, um, any others um, uh, that you think might be appropriate um, so that we can get some feedback on the front end um, in a kind of, obviously, you know, not as, a, not as an applicant, but as an umbrella organization that is representing the perspective of, of potential applicants. That's a good um, suggestion. So th Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, and then just one other thing. Um, I think we should go back and look at what has been said at, at previous hearings about contract registration for model budgets, because I'm pretty sure that it's been set, told to us that the, all these contracts should have been registered, all these amendments should have been registered a long time ago. The amendments specifically, not the, not the contracts themselves. Contract registration is a, has been a, another issue, but we're talking about the model budget amendments. We were under the impression that all of these amendments were gonna be registered by now. I'm pretty sure 
that DHS is the last agency to be registering its model budgets. So we can go back and look at that. Okay. Thanks. Okay, turn it over to Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> um, uh, have uh, has DHS worked with uh, the state on developing the uh, Creedmoor property? Because uh, I know there's a few programs running in there. There's some very nice uh, transitional housing. I took a tour uh, from a, a provider there. Um, model um, supportive housing, model transitional housing. Is there any um, plan plan to work with the state to try to create more of those there? Because there's 10, ten um, empty, very large buildings. They developed a couple into supportive housing. And then there's a whole community built in there of smaller kind of suburban houses, brand new, that are not lived in. Uh, we work collaboratively with the state in a lot of different settings. Um, I'm actually not familiar on this particular site where we stand, so I'm going to need to circle back. I would suggest that somebody from DHS go there and look at it. There's so many opportunities. There's a lot of space. It's wasted. It's um, a, a beautiful location. And for us to be putting people in hotels and motels uh, instead of supportive housing or... Uh, transitional housing when the opportunity is there and it's New York State New York City should work together and if you take a tour your draw your jaw will drop when you see the quality of the buildings there the space the park like setting that's just rotting away and it's almost criminal thank you when for you the see suggestion. it uh, just a couple of questions um, um, I have on the edge of my district, uh, it's just out of my district, the Pan Am shelter. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the, the capacity is 800 families, 800 people, something like that. Uh, no? Well, I don't have that right at my fingertips, but we can oh, get you back can get back. I mean, you yeah. can get, I'm not, I don't expect you to have this uh, right away in your notes. But um, what I also, if you can get back to me, as is because I know the, the provider was in violation of the contract for several years of not providing the contract called for the new contract called for installing kitchens I just want to make sure that all the kitchens were installed and how what the population is and what the capacity is so if you can get back to me on that because um, that was uh, an area of concern for the community that um, Cer the children were there without kitchens for a very long period of time Certainly. and um, um, also, dealing with 7816 Coop, I just want to go back to that. Um, I would hope that the agency would understand that providing a boilerplate contract, which is w apparently what was done, which is what we heard, um, is wasting people, everyone's time when it's not even filled out properly. And we knew, I knew it was 200, but why the contract reflected 88 while well, nobody even bothered to fix that, and so that got through, it, 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 it lends another, a lot of other questions. But not making it available to, to the um, duly elected council member in the district and having to work with DHS on basic information, which I still haven't gotten. That means I was given a fluctuating number of the number of homeless in Community Board 5 my, or a large part of my district and it fluctuated from 285 to 250 in the entire Community Board 5 district. I asked for a breakdown to Commissioner Banks uh, because I was trying to set up smaller uh, facilities and faith-based, uh, I have a lot of faith-based organizations that are willing and able to provide for the homeless. So I wanted to create smaller shelters. So I just wanted to know a breakdown of how many men, how many women, and how many children out of those 250. And I, re I was refused by Commissioner Banks saying that, oh, I can find out who they are that way, which I still can't figure that, that answer out. I can't. But why would I? I, d I don't want to identify them. I just want to know a number. But I can't, you, you're talking about DHS working with the council member. It's ridiculous to say that they worked with me because I couldn't even get that number. I was trying to do my part as a council member. I was trying to lead. I was trying to address the homeless situation in my district um, in a meaningful way that would, the community can accept. Yet 
I couldn't even get basic numbers, and I still can't. So and, I'm going to try, as chair of technology, to try to do that, because I, we deserve the right to have that, and it shouldn't be hidden, and it shouldn't be denied. So um, I'm asking once more okay. that I get that. I wasn't part of the sidebar that happened while, I, while the testimony was continuing, but I'll follow up with my colleagues who were, and we will circle back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Casper Holden. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time. I know it's been a couple of hours here that you've been with us, so I want to uh, uh, very much uh, appreciate over, over two hours, two and a half hours. So I want to thank you so much. Um, uh, welcome. All right. Thank you. Thanks um, for having me. Commissioner Drinkwater, thank you as well. Uh, and um, uh, we look forward to following up with you on all of these matters uh, in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we, will, we will have... Uh, we'll have one panel of public testimony. Uh, Catherine Trapani, Homeless Services United. Felix Guzman, Vocal New York and Coalition for the Homeless. Wendy O'Shields. Um, Diane, and I'm sorry, Diane, I'm, is that right? Diane Pagan, is that right? Pagan? Pagan? Diane Pagan? Um, Caroline Huntajulia and Tawaki Kamatsu. Right. Yes, it's only like three minutes. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, we go. Steve, thanks for the three minutes after they testified for two hours. Because they violate our due process rights every time. They violate our due process rights every time. Oh, Steve, can you get the rest of the council members present for our due process rights? Only you. I can wait here. Sit down and I will. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, sub, we'll sub out, but yes, uh, uh, Cassie Keith as well. Okay. So, uh, Ms. Keith, we'll, we'll um, if you want to take one of those seats, we'll, we'll uh, as, as somebody testifies, we'll rotate out. Okay, whoever wants to begin, we have a four minute clock. Um, um. Hello, is this on? Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, boy, am I disappointed that all of the fine people from DHS are, um, have left the room. Um, I wanted to just note a couple of things. Um, I'm a social worker and that's the reason that I'm here. I feel like it's the duty of all social workers to do some policy advocacy. Um, I did my own research last night um, and this weekend, as I often do. Uh, I wanted to know um, how it is that uh, the Department of Homeless Services uh, awards a contract to, for example, you can see on Checkbook NYC, uh, there's a contract for, of course, for children's community services. A lot of people are familiar. They have apparently a $368 million contract, and when I went to the, their website, there's, I'll tell you what data they don't have there. Um, they don't have any photographs of the facilities that the taxpayers are hoping they're using to help our most vulnerable New Yorkers. They don't have any client testimonials of their treatment in their facilities. Uh, they don't have any data of success rates of placing people in, uh, in permanent housing. They have no descriptions of their services, and we have used that, that word here a lot this morning. Um, services, what is that? That could be a range of things. The taxpayers, um, New York residents, need to know what these services are. Furthermore, I was looking at their um, employment uh, opportunities, and I noticed that we, I noticed that the description for housing specialist 
for uh, children's community services and for other shelter operators does not require any specialized knowledge of housing of any kind. Um, as a social worker who has a graduate degree, um, I am offended by the idea that we would give a $368 million contract to a, sh to a shelter rate uh, operator and not at a minimum seek detailed information immediately available to the public about what qualifies them to have that contract. I further want to point out that on the website for Children's Community Services, there is a, a header that says Board of Directors, but the Board of Directors is blank. So if it's blank, how do we get any accountability? The three people that are listed as being um, in charge of this organization, uh, there's a dead, I was able, there's nothing on the website that talks about what their qualifications are, unfortunately, but I was able to find a dead link that went to a page um, rife with grammatical errors, and it didn't seem to point out that they had any specialized knowledge of either uh, family trauma or poverty or psychological uh, uh, support or housing. So this is one of our major shelter operators. The second thing I'm gonna say, because I do wanna try to, you know, please cut me off when I reach my time out of respect for the people who really need to be heard. Um, I have a, a friend who is in a shelter for uh, homeless men in the Bronx. Um, that uh, shelter provider, I looked them up yesterday, um, NICA, and uh, they have a contract, at least two contracts I was able to identify, one of which is for $86 million, and it's a 10-year contract. Why, I question why the city would award a 10-year contract to a shelter provider. That's a long time. And I really think that we need to look at this to close, I will say, because the, the fine person from DHS, who I don't know her name, um, got very, uh, I think she used the word exciting to describe the construction of a few dozen more shelters. As a social worker who goes in and out of shelters every day and talks to people who are in shelters, what I can tell you is there is nothing exciting to ordinary people about building shelters. What's exciting is building airy, safe, functional housing in the community and providing income transfers or rent transfers to be able to house people in real apartments. I think what is going to need to happen at DHS, we will see an end to homelessness when we don't have DHS employees who think that shelters are exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Whoever wants to go next. My name is Carol. <laughs> Turn on the microphone, please. Are we on? Yep. Okay. My name is Caroline Contigulia. I'm a member of New Yorkers for Safer Streets, which is a grassroots group of over 1,000 concerned and proactive New York residents. On behalf of New Yorkers for Safer Streets, I've been conducting research on the safety and security of New York City's facilities for the homeless. I stand before you today to share our findings that are relevant to DHS's homeless service provider contracts. Dangerous and deplorable conditions persist in many New York City homeless shelter facilities. We believe that the number of open violations at homeless shelters can serve as a proxy for overall quality of shelter management. Therefore, nonprofit organizations that are managing numerous shelters with high levels of open violations are providing substandard service. We've analyzed the most recent New York City shelter repair scorecard data and found that three nonprofit organizations manage 23 of the top 25 worst performing buildings as measured by total open violations. These organizations are Children's Rescue Fund, Bronx, Bronx Family Housing, and Acacia. When we focused on just the 
high priority open violations, we found that these same three organizations manage 19 of the 25 worst performing buildings. The building with the most open violations is managed by Aguila, and this building has a total of 196 open violations, 38 of which are classified as high priority. As New Yorkers, we all have a moral obligation to provide safe shelter to the homeless residents of our city. As our elected officials, you have the duty to require that DHS utilize quality shelter service providers. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to be respectful of my colleagues. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Japani. I'm the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. Um, I have submitted written testimony for the record, but just in deference of time, I want to go over a couple of, of issues just verbally. And um, if I could take a step back a little bit into sort of how we got here and acknowledge that Although um, I'm very proud of the work that HSU's membership does in partnering with the city of New York to uphold the right to shelter to everyone in the city that needs it, I want to acknowledge that there are challenges in our system, um, much of which has to do with the structure of the contracts, the reimbursement, and decades of disinvestment that have really allowed the system to decay. So I think Commissioner Park did a good, idea, uh, good job of, of spelling out that history, but I do just want to um, point to a couple of things. Um, I hear a lot of concerns in this hearing about large providers, um, particular nonprofits um, that have an outsized share of shelter census and therefore an outsized share of the challenges that we're all trying to face together. I will say that the city has relied on nonprofits to uphold the right to shelter throughout the history of the Department of Homeless Services, and it's the largest shelters and the largest nonprofit providers, I should say, that are best poised to take on the risk to actually bid on those contracts and be able to take things to scale quickly. So I do just want to hold for a second that there is some correlation between the size of nonprofits, their ability to uphold the right to shelter, and, and why we, we tend to have um, challenges in our portfolio. I also want to hold that the model budget amendments, as you pointed out, Chair Levin, have yet to be registered. So while we're very happy for the investment that exists on paper, the results of that investment has yet to really hit the streets. And so that's why our clients and our, and our providers are still not seeing the, the, the results associated with that that we all very much look forward to. Um, so I think that's really important to note. The other piece that's important is that even when um, all of those amendments are ultimately registered, and, and they will be. Um, the model budget did not answer every need of homeless folks in New York City by a long shot. Um, there's certainly, uh, you've spoken about the need for investment in vouchers, permanent uh, supportive housing, and all the different housing initiatives that would ultimately reduce the reliance on shelters in the first place. Um, we haven't spoken about the, the service components that were left out of the model budget. You talked about what we still need in hotels, namely client care coordinators, social workers that are not available to, to folks um, in homeless hotels. But other things that were left out were salary increases, um, salary parity across different shelters. We were told over and over that when we asked for more money to better compensate our staff, which presumably would lead to higher employee retention and easier recruitment, we were told over and over, this is not an exercise in salary parity. That's not what the model budget is for. We have instances where some of our shelter providers um, who were already at or above the model were told that they could not have new investments in their facilities. Um, even in situations where DHS had told the nonprofit that they were approving additional case management staff and security to respond to some community concerns that were in the area, DHS had approved the spending, the nonprofit spent the money, $2 million later, OMB said no. Now that nonprofit is faced with a $2 million deficit and no way to continue those specialized services going forward, breaking their promises to the community and to their clients. Um, so we are not finished. Um, so I just want to point out where there's still work to do. Um, and, and, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of, some of the things that we still need and for, for your advocacy, frankly, uh, Chair Kalos and Chair, uh, Chair Levin, on, on what we can do moving forward. And I just want to close, and I know I'm going to be just a little bit over time, um, to say that there is a 
spectacularly cruel irony when we are sitting in this room talking about how terrible homeless hotels are, talking about you know how much our homeless clients deserve better, and then still talking about how when an award-winning design comes to your district um, and would provide 195 families with trauma-informed services and care that this council can say no. Um, and when we are voting down new purpose-built shelters because we have this magical thinking that landlords would accept the next 200 families that showed up at PATH, when we know that's not how permanent housing actually works, um, we have a real problem. So I applaud Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Lander for asking how we can site new shelters in their districts. We need to do more of that, and we really need to cut it out with the hypocrisy of saying that shelter is not a necessary component of the safety net. We protested when families were sit sleeping overnight at the EAU. I will not go back to those days. We must uphold the right to quality shelter. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you. My name is Wendy O. Shields, and I'm an advocate in the city of New York and the co-founder of the Urban Justice Safety Net Activist. City Council, please include the D in the DHS homeless service provider contracts the following for single adult shelter residents. One, DHS implement HUD housing first and HUD rapid rehousing as the first line of defense to house single adult shelter homeless residents. Both components should utilize for, be utilized for either independent or supportive housing. Supportive housing should not remain 99.9% .9 path for most single adult shelter residents as their main path to housing. Independent housing should be developed and made a clear path for single adult residents. Two, DHS homeless service provider housing specialist intake should be completed within 48 hours of re residency at the assessment shelter or a newly assigned shelter. Each shelter resident shall have a housing specialist assigned to their case. The resident should have a biweekly appointment with their housing specialist to develop a housing plan with the goal of securing independent or supportive housing. Three, DHS single adult long-term shelter stayers are residents that have received zero to very little contact with a housing specialist. A, most long-term shelter stayers are blocked from having an appointment with a housing specialist because DHS says they are not housing ready. Most uh, long-term shelter stayers have, re have resided in shelter for five, seven, 10, or more years without having one appointment with a housing specialist. Four, DHS homeless service provider contracts shall include a clause to not retaliate against the single adult shelter resident with a DHS administrative transfer or a sanction to the streets for asking for an appointment with a housing specialist, for asking to spend their money from their employment to buy food, toiletries, essential clothing, pay their cell phone bill, child support, alimony, or court-mandated bankruptcy payments, or creditors. Five, DHS homeless service provider contracts shall include the term, terms and definitions for formerly homeless or currently homeless. Six, DHS homeless service provider contracts shall require safe, clean, up to code, up to building code shelters and independent or high quality, well-run supportive housing to be offered to single adult residents. Seven, the New York State new shelter regulations take effect January 1st, 2020. DHS and their DHS service providers will abide by the new regulations for single adult shelter residents. Eight, DHS homeless service provider contracts define the process for a single adult shelter resident and secure, uh, to secure a DHS homeless set aside apartment. Including my suggestions in the DHS homeless service provider contract will hold providers accountable for the single adult residents 
five, seven, 10 or more years of detention as a billable in shelters, unnoticed and not uncounted. Thank you for including my suggestions in the new city contract with the DHS homeless service providers. Thank you very much, Mr. Shields. Mm -hmm. oh, hold on. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Felix Guzman. I am a part of uh, several different housing movements with Vocal New York, College for the Homeless, Fortune Society, Community Access, and uh, also Street Homeless Helping Out Human.NYC. I am here actually representing the formerly incarcerated as well as those with mental health impacts, uh, also the fathers that, don't, that require housing to be with their children. Again, uh, having said that, I am also a regular tenant of a building turned cluster site which impacted my livelihood and able to provide for my child. Again, um, imagine being a housing specialist at the same time that your building is turned into a shelter. Imagine having to uh, turn into HRA to find out where you can take your child because your building becomes a war zone. They told me to take my kid into shelter. If I would have done that, I would have gotten Amber alerted without my uh, partner's permission. And later on, as a result of that DV relationship that I was in, I actually found myself in shelter. And the madness of what I experienced outside as a cluster site residence was magnified. Imagine your building where you have lived, where you have nowhere else to go as a formerly incarcerated person because no one will rent to you. Imagine coming back home, broken mailboxes, people trapping out their apartments. You got sex workers and their uh, employers or whatever have you. Then you have drug dealers overtly, broken mailboxes, people going up and down the fire escape, rumors of breaking and entering, people using drugs overtly in the hallways. That is madness. Imagine going to work and actually trying to work a nine to five to keep your credit score in line. You can try and find an affordable apartment where your apartment is rent stabilized. A two bedroom where you can provide for your child. Imagine going into shelter, then going to the most, some of the corrupt ones that you actually hear the headlines. CCS, Eddie Harris Center, Bedford Atlantic, Acacia. These people receive hundreds of millions of dollars every few years. Maybe Acacia's gotten over a billion, whatever, in the last 10 to 12. Where is a permanent housing being provided to people that are in shelter? Do the taxpayers know how much is actually being paid to a shelter provider by the city itself? The city is cannibalizing itself to pay itself to provide in permanent housing to create the, that's actually having, causing these lawsuits to happen that people are getting violated in shelter and all types of stuff because they cannot find safe, affordable housing as a result of landlords refusing to take vouchers and the market not providing entry points re-entry points for the homeless. As a formerly incarcerated person, also the face of uh, something that's gonna happen, I implore you to understand that when you put people in situations where it's dog eat dog, they are victims and victims become bully victims and then bullies. At the expense of the taxpayer, we are actually spending money where it should not be. As a shelter monitor, I go into the shelters with College for the Homeless. So I see the flim flam from the operations staff talking to me. As a resident, I saw the staff taking advantage. Why are we hiring security staff that are not accountable? They go on to another shelter, we don't, then they still keep that same license that the state provides. Why aren't they being civilly and criminally held liable? And then again, as a former housing specialist, understanding the very intricate details of housing, the vouchers, also what supportive housing means to the mentally ill and the formerly incarcerated, I can see that homelessness is a manufactured problem. It's a manufactured problem, meaning that it's, a, it's what came first, the chicken or the egg. Being the only city in the world with a right to shelter mandate, this should be the example and not the epicenter of the crisis that keeps growing and growing and growing because we're throwing money at a problem, allowing it to continue because we're, we're not even treating or curing anything. We're just allowing things to people to line their pockets. And I don't know, but when I was incarcerated, that's, that looks like the same setup that I had when I, was, I mean, when I was in shelter. That looked like the same setup I had when I was incarcerated. Like a two or three inch mattress, a green locker, and everything, all my possessions were in there. Now imagine, having to find a home so you can be with your child, and then I'm a deadbeat father because I can't have safe, affordable housing? I don't understand. I don't know how you people sleep at night, but it's definitely, I do not sleep on Egyptian, cotton, 10,000 thread, or none of that. I sleep with a heavy heart, trying to actually do right and actually live with a moral compass because wherever I hold space, 
the formerly incarcerated, the mentally ill, those in recovery, and those that are trying desperately to be moral, upstand upstanding citizens of the city of New York are, and I refuse to be silenced. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Hi, um, is this on? Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. Um, Richie Torres illegally kicked me out of a hearing on November 13th. This testimony is for the benefit of federal judges. I have a lawsuit against the city. Um, in my preliminary remarks, there was a death in my building over the weekend. It's run by Urban Pathways. I've told all of you about that previously. All of you have done jack about it. So this testimony is for federal judges, not for you. I don't trust any of you. And I have said to you as follows, you have a right to review contracts, and we have arranged for you to be able to do that. We cannot arrange for you to do that in our building because, could I just finish? We, it is not discriminatory. We made a reasonable accommodation for you because the building security, not HRA security, made a determination about remarks that you made when you were on premises. You disagree with that determination, but we made... Sir, let me finish. It would be one thing if you said, we're denying you the right to see the contract. We are not denying you the right to see the contract. Every time you request to see a contract, we make it available to you to be seen at another location. There's nothing in the law that requires it to be viewed at a particular location. Then I would urge you to go to the City Bar Association. They have a pro bono night. You can review the decisions that we've made, and if they agree with you, then you could certainly bring a lawsuit. And last question, it pertains to FOIL requests. Um, I was assaulted in the building where I reside. I submitted FOIL requests to HRA to find out after I reported to HRA back in, I think, March of 2016, uh, my complaints against Urban Pathways, like what action they took in regards to my complaints. Um, HRA has refused to comply with those FOIL requests that I have a uh, First Amendment right to. So you've raised this with us before. HRA made a determination. If you don't agree with it, you can go to a legal services provider, you can go to the City Bar Association, and you can challenge it. Um, we don't agree with your conclusion. But just to let you know, I'm going to take a different route. Okay. Um, I have papers. You told me last time when we talked to either go the New York Supreme Court route or the federal route. Um, I don't recall saying that to you, but I will accept yeah. that. So, bottom line is, I'm going to file papers today in my federal lawsuit, and I'm going to file it. What is that against HRA? It implicates HRA and you uh, personally. Okay. Um, so basically, I'm going to advise the federal judge uh, that you lied during the testimony yesterday during the city hall. The instructions say to call you to schedule an appointment in this public notice. I'm doing that right now. So are you going to make those contracts available to me to see before that hearing on December 12th? Well, but the point is you cannot call you to see the contract. Well, we'll uh, why is that exactly? I have not been told why. I don't know. I don't know, sir. I wish I could tell you. But the point is, if you're, if the notice is saying to call you to make this appointment to see those contracts on the 37th floor at 150 Grand Street. Why don't you send me an email in there? I did. That's the point. I sent you an email on November uh, 28th, and I did not get a response. Okay. I, will I can get somebody to respond to you. No, no one did. Yes. No one did. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Somebody did respond to you. Was it yesterday? Nope. I didn't get I didn't get any response about that email. Well, I think I saw an email that was addressed to you, sir. What was that? There was an email addressed to you either yesterday or no, it was yesterday, but even Friday. I did not get any email about that meeting, those contracts. None. Okay. Let's see. I did not get any phone call, I did not get any email, I did not get any letter, nothing. So, oh, a question, another question I had for you. Um, do you know, has anyone from the public been to HRA's office? So, let me wrap up my testimony. Um, I've testified here previously. I have a federal lawsuit against the city. I have a federal lawsuit against the city. Um, Judge Schofield issued a decision on September 30th in my favor against the city, saying that she would intervene on my behalf to prevent this practice from continuing to violate my constitutional rights at public forums. So um, after today's meeting, I'm going to go straight to DOI. I'm going to play back that same audio that I just played for your benefit. And I'm going to ask them to pursue criminal charges against Mr. Romain and others at HRA for witness tampering. I had a legal right to see those contracts prior to today's hearing. They violated section 175.25 of the New York Penal Code. 
as well as 215.10. So yeah, um, I'm going to pursue criminal charges against Mr. Romain, as well as Stephen Banks, who has been fully aware of this fact that I've been prevented from accessing those contracts prior to public hearings. That's Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamasu. Thank you. Okay, um, we have two more uh, people to testify. Uh, Cassie Keith, who I called up uh, earlier, and is, is Gerard or Gerald? Um, uh, sorry? Froen Hoffer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for your patience, and thank you to Transportation Committee people who are waiting to. to come into the room. While we're waiting for the next panel, I want to thank the members of the public who came and uh, spent uh, approximately five hours waiting to testify and to share their voice, uh, folks who are blowing the whistle for making their voices heard. Uh, and that we will work with you to make sure that you are safe and protected and that your voices are heard. On the red light. On the red light. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Fronhofer. Uh, I'm the founder of the Fiorello Homes for the Homeless Campaign Association and a CUNY faculty member in urban sociology. I'm here today to challenge you, our mayor, our controller, as well as our city advocate. Tonight, as you well know, over 114,000 children and more than 30,000 families in our city have no bed of their own to sleep in tonight. We see our shelter population growing to over 60,000 men, women, and children. 70% of our homeless are families with children. Ms. Chris Christine Quinn, a former speaker of this body, recently said in an interview on New York One and on Christine Amapur's program that more than 43% of our homeless adults go to work every day. They are caught in the crossfire of low wages, low wages and high rent. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of us want to live in a shelter tonight? And we heard some very significant testimony before I spoke of what that means. How many of us want to double up and triple up with our friends, neighbors, for an indeterminate period of time? Let's not raise our hands all at once. Let's get real. We are facing a moral crisis, an ethical crisis, a spiritual crisis. We are condemning a future generation to a life of misery and dependency on a faulting shelter system and a non-working so-called affordable housing plan of our mayor and his commissioner, Mr. Banks. They're talking about 1,000 permanent housing units per year. This has to be a joke. We are the richest city in the world. We definitely can do much better than that. We have the land over 1,100 city-owned vacant lots. We have the money by sunsetting tax abatements and more efficiently using the 2.5 billion that we are spending each year on homeless services. We have the technology to build new public, green, low-density, modular housing for our homeless and offer to many of them over the years an option to buy. I left on a table or just asked Councilman Holden he knows our plan, as well as State Senator Dabo and Assemblyman Hevesy. In short, what the homeless need are homes, not shelters. If Houston, Texas, under the leadership of its mayors, Eric Samuels and Sylvester Turner, can bring down its homeless population by 54 percent in less than six years, why can't we? Where the leader, where's the leadership? Let's not just say homelessness in New York City is unacceptable. Let's work and do something about it. Our mayor is the hallmark of the unacceptable. Let's gain back our morality and solve this horror and not dump it on others like New Jersey. Pass a resolution in favor of Assemblyman Hevesy's home stability program. Pass a resolution to stop building shelters 
and start building homes. Pass a resolution to make our mayor accountable to our elected representatives, our community planning boards, and to our public will. Let's build villages of hope, not shelters of despair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Keith. Good afternoon. My name is Cassie Keith, and I'm here to testify about what happened to me at one of the Acacia Network shelter called Stadium Shelter. Um, many things happened, but um, one example is one night I was attacked by two clients in my room with a cane that left me with multiple injuries, including swollen scab and blood all over my bed that could be clearly seen by the Acacia security officers and DHS officers. DHS officers informed me that if I press charges against my attacker, I will also be arrested. I managed to record a second attack by the same people with my phone and show it to the Acacia security officer who then alerted my attackers that I had them on video. My attacker, for the third time, attacked me and took my phone and threw it against the wall, destroying it. This is the phone that they destroyed. The next day, I met with social service who asked the security guard about the video and she admitted seeing it, of people attacking me. I expected compensation, but instead I was attacked for supposedly getting another security officer fired at the previous shelter. I was informed, had I not done that, I would have been compensated. Acacia run its own security firm. This is a clear conflict of interest. It means security staff are not accountable to anyone. DHS staff and Acacia security are working to back each other up. They encourage residents to call 311 to complain because their name will be revealed and uh, this is a threat. I believe Acacia has gotten away with a lot for so long because DHS is not doing the job of holding them accountable, nor are they holding any other shelter accountable. DHS has to do a better job. Complaints need to be taken seriously, especially when people are talking about sexual harassment, abuse, violence, physical intimidation by employees. DHS and Acacia staff and other uh, shelter staff consider you an enemy when you file a complaint and work together to transfer you to some of the worst shelter and laugh about it. They also protect perpetrators of violence or those who violate DHS rules and regulation and retaliate against the one that filed the complaint, making shelter unsafe for nonviolent residents. We need a separate oversight agency to receive shelter complaint in, in addition to DHS, my experience is with the entire shelter system is that DHS can hold any company such as Acacia or any or NICA, the present shelter where I'm at, accountable. Resident, we have lost trust in DHS. We need, uh, and we never stop fighting for our uh, dignity and our right, but we need an oversight, an independent agency that will receive those complaints in addition to DHS. Because recently, like last week, I filed a complaint against my current shelter, NICA, in the Bronx. And they retaliated against me by making me do my laundry from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Just drag it out the entire day, retaliation, right away. And I am lactose intolerant. DHS told them to order lactose-free milk or almond milk, single use. They refused to do it. They buy the big uh, you know, gallon and sit in the refrigerator. Everybody drinks it. And since I re they retaliate against me, when they give me the cup, I find stuff in it. And it sit in the refrigerator. I refuse to do it, to drink, you know, to, 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 to drink milk like this. Everybody else received the cotton, the, the, the cotton milk except me because I'm lactose intolerant. They just told them to order uh, substitute food that has no milk in it whenever they, they cook, you know, they bring food that have milk in it like cheese, they refuse to do it. Some days I have no breakfast, no breakfast, because every breakfast that they bring has milk in it. And they would tell me there's no bread, just juice. This is your, 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 your breakfast. No, 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 no food, nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And, um, and w w you can follow up with, uh, with any of either Councilmember Kalos or myself on any okay. of these issues. Um, okay, I want to thank my co-chair. I uh, just want to thank you for telling your story for me before so that we could share that story and other in the press to hold folks accountable and somebody who's lactose intolerant, I, I, I feel and hear where you're coming from and they do need to accommodate you. And mm -hmm. if you're still experiencing that, uh, um, for those who spoke out today who are concerned about retaliation, 
DHS has offered to provide transfers for those who need them. Transfers, convictions. Okay, and I want to thank everybody that testified today um, for your um, very helpful testimony. We look forward to working with all of you, and I want to wish everybody a happy holidays and a happy new year. And with that, at 1.24, the hearing is adjourned.